ahead and get started. Good evening. I'd like to uh, call the meeting to order. Will the uh, city clerk call the roll, please? The record will reflect that all members of council are present. Councilmember Rosansky is will be at his desk shortly. Have a seat. Yeah, and there he is. is Thank you. <laughs> Mr. City Attorney, do we have a closed session report? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. The City Council met in closed session to discuss the multiple items that are reflected on your agenda. No reportable action was taken. Thank you. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem Michael Hinn will lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance, followed by the invocation by Reverend Robert uh, Jortland Ross of the Newport Universalist Society. Please stand. Please repeat with me. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, Lord, the girl who has much homework to do tonight can't be here to help direct the running of our city. And besides, she's 14 and suspect her voice might not be heard here. The older man who sold his business three years ago and watches his old friends struggle to stay afloat doesn't drive much at night anymore, but wishes he could put in a few words tonight. A father who is just now finishing an hour and more of coaching soccer is bursting with ideas for his city, but he will not be here for this evening, for he must be up early to teach a 7 a.m. class at the university in medical instrument development. And the woman whose architectural plans must be sent out tonight and who builds her dreams into them, will be at work hours after we have gone home and thinks how nice it would be if she could even text those dreams to us all. Lord, we pray that as the eyes and ears of this good council are indeed open and clear to all of us who may show or tell them of our longings and our visions, so also will you keep open their spirits and imaginations that the soft songs sung only in the hearts of our people may be subtly heard by them and folded into their ever-maturing plans for our city. For we would ask your blessing on these counselors, that when that time of service is completed, they may know that the hopes your people have had and the journeys they have undertaken will have been fulfilled more effectively than otherwise through the labors of those who are here at work tonight. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. I'd like to invite our librarian, Cynthia Cowell, to the podium for a presentation regarding uh, awards to the library. Mayor and Council, good evening. It is a pleasure to be here to share with you an award, there are two awards actually the library has recently won. The first one being yet another star distinction by the Library Journal Reporting Group. This is something we have won several times in the past, but we for some reason got the same award twice this year. So who knew, but we're glad to tell you that good news anyway. But most importantly, we received an award for our Corona Del Mar Branch Library 50th anniversary celebration. This is a PR Excellent Award, uh, Excellence Award given by the California Library Association, and we received this last uh, October at the annual conference. Now, we did this whole project at the request of you and our citizens to enhance library service at Corona Del Mar. And as it so happened, this all came to fruition during the 50th anniversary year of the, of the branch. We had some public relations goals. We just mostly wanted to reassure the community that you and we took it seriously that the library was to be an enduring symbol in that community. So what we did is just revitalize the branch with adding computers, laptops, desktops. We painted, we cleaned, we removed old books and materials that weren't circulating. We just made it a much more inviting place for our residents. 
and we added some late night hours at the request of students who needed a quiet place to study. So we wanted to honor the future and the past and we presented this book of beautiful PR pieces to California Library Association. We first created the landmark logo. By the way, we did not have outside professional help to do this. It was all done by library staff. And all our printing was done in-house, too. Uh, we created Save the Date things, which you all received in the mail, I'm sure. We received our, we printed our invitations. We did all of the bookmarks and posters, all the normal things. We also had a scrapbook that we created online and in print. And we also enhanced the library's website to include this anniversary celebration. So we have a lot of written memories from our old patrons who've been around 50 or more years down to our three and four year olds who just drew pictures and they're in the book too. But we had a whole week of celebrations and probably most notable by his absence was Elvis, but uh, he was there in spirit as part of the uh, table decorations. And just a, a wonderful afternoon and then a beautiful morning to cut the ribbon and reopen the building. Uh, children's programming enhanced, the collection has been revamped and enhanced. And there on the bottom right is Councilwoman Gardner with her lovely little granddaughter Cleo uh, enjoying a story hour. Uh, didn't mean to go quite so fast. We had a lot of good press coverage, uh, which we appreciate. And we do believe that our project has been very successful. Lots of people are coming in and telling us how much they enjoy the library and how much they appreciate the fact that we did take them seriously, listen to them, and come up with a plan for enhancing library service there. And this is from a customer who wrote this. This building is notable in that it was financed 80% by donations from residents and a generous gift of library trustee Dorothy Harry. It grew, it has thrived, it has been beloved and treasured. Thank you all. And thank you for making this possible for us through uh, your support and, and some financial help. I might add too that this project came in way under budget. <laughs> and, uh, on time. Right. and on time. Mayor Curry, I have a presentation for you if you can step down. I just want to thank Cynthia because when she first came to the city, my first question to her was, and how do you feel about the Corona Del Mar branch? And she said, oh, I have big plans for it. And you did, and you accomplished them beautifully. Thank you so much. It was our pleasure, and I really want to let you know and re reinforce very much that the community is using the facility. They're responding to ideas for programming, giving us a lot of support, and we are very grateful for all of that because it just makes a good library better. Thank you. And for those of you that haven't been to the Corona Del Mar Library recently, I encourage you to go. It's really been done very, very nicely, as you saw in the, in the photographs. It's been entirely reinvented, and Councilmember Gardner and our library staff are really to be commended for that uh, great job. Madam City Clerk. Notice to the public, the city provides a yellow sign-in card to assist in the preparation of the minutes. The completion of the card is not required in order to address the council. Speakers must limit comments to five minutes on agenda items. The council has a discretion to extend or shorten the time limit on agenda or non-agenda items. As a courtesy, please turn cell phones off or set them in the silent mode. Now is the time for council announcements or matters which council members would like placed on a future agenda for discussion, action, or report.
Councilmember Daigle. Uh, yes, for those of you driving in this evening from Corona Del Mar and as you pass Dover and just before McDonald's, you can see those um, vacant buildings and it's uh, truly an eyesore. And the council, uh, one of our objectives is to clean up that property. And if the city attorney could uh, give us an update, please, on, on uh, how things are going. Certainly. Uh, as the council recalls, I believe it was in August, you authorized the office of the city attorney to give notice to the property owners of violation and the potential institution of nuisance litigation and the seeking of appointment of a trustee to take over the property under the supervision of the court. We gave that notice. Uh, in the wake of that notice, they entered into negotiations. We've been in the process of trying to work out the issues related to it on a fast track as fast as we could uh, through the negotiation of a development agreement to address all the issues there and address the use of the property into the future. It is my understanding that some agreements in principle have been reached regarding a development agreement. We're expecting a draft from the other side in the next two weeks. I'm also informed that there is another person or an entity that is interested in the property and some portion of the property has gone into escrow for acquisition by a private person or entity um, and that's where I believe the current status of that property is. Well, thank you for that update. Councilmember Gardner? Councilmember Webb? Kathy. Councilmember Selich? Oh, I have kind of a fun little thing here. A, fr a friend of mine, uh, Waukee Ray, lent me a copy of the uh, Newport Beach City Budget from 1954, 56 years ago. And since we're getting into budget, I would just read a couple of facts that the uh, total budget for the city in 1954 was uh, $1.5 million. Um, the capital improvements portion of that was $154,000. And uh, just to make our city employees feel good, they did a salary survey that year and they determined that the, um, the fire chief and the police chief should get $515 a month. The um, city engineer, Don, uh, received $591 a month, so he was higher paid than the police and fire chief in those days. And the city manager got a whopping uh, $710 a month. And Mr. City Attorney, I'm really sorry, you only got $375 a month. <laughs> Anyway, that's the way it was in 1954. Okay, thank you. Councilman Rosansky? Nothing, thank you. Mayor Pro Tem Hinn? I have nothing, thank you. Just a, a couple of quick things. Uh, January 22nd to 28th will once again bring Restaurant Week to Newport Beach. It's a great opportunity to get out and really enjoy some terrific values in some of Newport Beach's finest restaurants. Uh, restaurants are the largest sales tax generator for the city, so it's important for us to be able to drive business to our restaurants, but I think you'll also see some great opportunities to be out with your, your family and friends and enjoy some great value. So please uh, take advantage uh, of that. On Saturday, the City Council met with staff uh, to focus on city priorities. These will be coming back to us uh, in our next meeting for consideration by the Council. But I thought it was an excellent session and I think the staff did a remarkably, well, uh, remarkably good job in putting this together. And we focused on six real priority value areas of the city and have about 41 or more action items that are associated with each one of those. Preserving our high quality of life, particularly as it relates to public safety in the airport. Maintaining our fiscal stability. Effectively managing the city. Keeping the city economically strong and sustainable. Having a strong environmentally sustainable community and in doing the kinds of community enhancements that add public value going forward. So I think you're going to be very excited by the work program that the city has. It's an ambitious program, but one that I'm very uh, excited about. So with that, we'll move on to the consent calendar. Consent calendar, all matters listed under consent calendar, items 1 through 18 and supplemental item S21 are considered by council to be routine and will be enacted by one motion in the form listed below. The City Council members have received detailed staff reports on each of the items recommending an action. There will be no separate discussion of these items prior to the time the Council votes on the motion unless members of the Council, staff, or the public request specific items to be discussed and or removed from the consent calendar for separate action. Members of the public who wish to discuss the consent calendar item should come forward to the lectern upon invitation by the Mayor and state their name and item number. If the optional sign-in card has been completed, it should be placed in the box provided at the podium. Thank you. Does uh, any member of the council have any item they wish to pull? Councilmember Member Daigle? Uh, no items to pull, Mr. Mayor, but I did want to comment on number nine, that uh, the city did submit a revised eelgrass management plan to the federal government. And the purpose of number nine is to hire our former uh, Harbor Resources Manager, 
um, Tom R Ross Miller to help us uh, navigate the maze at uh, National Marine Fisheries. Thank you. Councilmember Gardner? Uh, I'd like to pull number five and add number 14, which is the committees. The uh, uh, number 4E, the Green Task Force, that has sunsetted, so uh, we can okay. eliminate that when we vote. Okay. Councilman Webb? I have none. Councilman Selich? I have none. Councilman Rosansky? I'd just like a clarification on number 15. The staff report says that uh, this has to do with the solicitation of um, or the draft RFP for street sweeping services. It says here that there's going to be two service alternatives, one for bi-monthly sweeping and one for weekly sweeping. I think that's, isn't that like bi-weekly sweeping? Should be bi-weekly, yes. <coughs> just want to make sure that. A correction. Don't want to have a, someone submitting an RFP for bi-monthly sweeping. Mayor Pro Tem Hinn. Uh, nothing to pull but comments on two. Uh, with regard to item number four on temporary banners, uh, this was again at the initiative of the Economic Development Committee uh, to provide more flexibility and a better chance for our local businesses to promote their uh, businesses to the public uh, by providing relaxed requirements for the posting of banners. And so it's a, a, another part of our uh, attempt to help with fiscal sustainability uh, uh, for the city. And then item number 11 on the Harbor Patrol, uh, the month-to-month the -month extension in that contract, I noted that there was a near tripling of intended charges to our city from the Sheriff's Harbor Department, uh, apparently, that led us to select a monthly, month-to-month uh, -month renewal uh, while we're looking at uh, request for proposal for others to provide that service. And so uh, that was a very extraordinary increase that was uh, requested by the Sheriff's Department. And I'm glad that we are proceeding in the way we are with a request for proposal. And, and just to be clear, that's for mooring administration, not for the patrol services. Correct. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to pull item 18 for purposes of making some clarifications. Does the staff have any item they wish to pull? No, sir. Do any members of the public have any item on the consent calendar they would like to uh, remove for discussion? Okay, seeing none, we're ready for a motion. Mr. Mayor, I approve approval of the uh, I move approval of the consent calendar items 1 through 18 and supplemental item number S21, except for items 5 and I believe 14. You did wish to pull 14? No, just to make the correction of the removal of the Green Task Force. Therefore, not pulling item number 14, but noting the correction to the Green Task Force and item number 18. Second. Okay, motion and second. And just also to clarify on item 14, we are uh, reappointing Ken Delishak as chairman of EQAC. He's indicated his desire to move from there, so this will be a short-term reappointment as chairman. Is there any discussion on the items on the consent calendar? Seeing none, please vote. Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Item number five. Uh, this is the Fletcher Jones redesign of the right-of-way. They talk about access parking for the public because that is one of the access areas of Back Bay. How much parking do we have there now from them? Are we losing, gaining? Is it a neutral? I'm not sure what the requirement originally was, but there are going to be six spaces that are signed for coastal access only. So they won't be able to use for any other purpose. And, and currently the, the public parking out there um, is not signed with the possible exception of a time limit. So. Um, we often find that customers of Fletcher Jones are using those spaces with the signage Mr. Batum is talking about. Mm -hmm. It will be limited. Oh, I have a feeling customers will still be using it. <laughs> but we are, yeah. we still, we're not losing, as far as you know, we're not losing access, no. access parking? I, I think it's at, at least no change, and it might be even a gain. Okay, thank you. Uh, I move the, 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 the action. I'm Moved and seconded. Is there any further discussion? Is anyone from the audience wish to speak on item five? Seeing none, please vote. Mo motion carries unanimously. Thank you. On item 18, this is the motion to uh, appoint a selection committee for the uh, uh, Charter Update Commission. Uh, we actually, the committee has sort of met on an ad hoc basis. There were 14 applicants, and the committee has decided to advance all 14 applicants to consideration at, next, uh, at the next council meeting, so there is no need uh, for, for interviews of any of the applicants. There's seven positions on the commission. 
In addition to that, I want to give uh, direction to the city attorney. The, the language uh, that was in the original resolution uh, was somewhat uh, uh, confining in terms of representatives from each council district. In some cases, we don't have representatives from council districts who have applied, so we need some flexibility there. Also, the language, uh, when read literally, implied that if you couldn't be at a specific meeting on a specific date, that you were not eligible, and I think we need to give some flexibility to accommodate some schedules. So when we come back on the 26th, I'd like a resolution that accomplishes that flexibility. Uh, with that, I will move the item. Yes, sir. Second. Any further discussion? Any member of the public wish to speak on item 18? Seeing none, please vote. Motion carries unanimously. Okay. Uh, we're now prepared for oral reports from city council members on committee activities. Council member Daigle? I have none. Council member Gardner? Nothing. Council member Webb? None. Council member Selich? I have none. Council member Rosansky? None, thank you. Mayor Pro Tim Hinn? Uh, Two comments regarding the Economic Development Committee. Uh, I wanted to note, as we see in the agenda tonight, uh, to welcome David Zhang for the uh, member at large for the Economic Development Committee being appointed, as well as um, Kim Van Natta, who will represent Fashion Island on that committee. And then at the uh, Economic Development Executive Committee meeting just the other day, we had a very interesting report from Gary Sherwin, who runs the Visit Newport Beach organization, formerly the Convention and Visitors Bureau, Conference and Visitors Bureau. Uh, Gary had a very interesting report regarding the status of our hotel industry here. And uh, the downside of that report was that the industry is down about 20% overall for last year. Uh, the upside is that the recent monthly changes have been showing upticks now since the month of June. And so it's, we've at least established a pretty consistent recovery trend. Uh, we've got a fairly big hole to, di uh, to dig out of, but that's a very encouraging uh, sign, at least, as we head into this year. And I'm sure things were helped to some extent by the BCS hotel occupancy uh, for the Bowl Championship Series. So there you go. Very good. Uh, and I have none. The, uh, we're now prepared for uh, public comments. Public comments are invited on non-agenda items generally considered to be within the subject matter jurisdiction of the council. Speakers must limit comments to three minutes. Before speaking, please state your name for the record. If anyone would like to speak to the council on an item not on tonight's agenda, please come forward. Seeing none, thank you. Uh, next item is item 19, the uh, McMonagall residence uh, on Pacific Drive modification permit. Uh, Mr. Giff. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, as you noted, this is a public hearing on the McGonagall residence. Um, the typical way to begin this would be to conduct the public hearing. Um, you would authorize uh, the applicant to speak first, potentially with a, with a time constraint, um, then open the public hearing, including potentially organizing those that, that may not speak in favor of the applicant's uh, proposal. And then uh, council comments are usually welcome at any point in there, depending on your, your preference. And then finally, the applicant usually gets a chance to come back up and rebut um, anything or clarify anything that needed to be clarified. Uh, so with, and then at the conclusion of that, if the council is, is willing to do this, the recommended action, the recommendation is to um, adopt a draft resolution certifying an EIR associated with this project and adopting a mitigation monitoring reporting plan and then adopting a second resolution relating to a modification permit. Okay. May I ask the audience how many would like to or are planning to speak on this matter tonight? Also, could, could we ask is there anyone that is representing the applicant? The, no, we know there's someone here representing the applicant, but those, uh, the, for example, the Friends of Begonia well, Park or something. Yeah, is there someone here as a spokesman for the opposition? Well, we have, oh, we have some self-selected candidates. Yeah, no, okay. What, right. I, what I would like to do in consideration of each other's time is to ask the council to, uh, to have comments be limited to three minutes, invite the applicant to make a 15-minute opening, and then have five minutes at the end to close, and then have anyone who would like to speak Please uh, focus your comments within three minutes. So with that, I will invite the applicant to the podium. 
Uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, Ms. Wood is reminding me that it's probably appropriate that um, there be a city staff presentation about the project before this. Okay. So I apologize. All right. Um, and Mr. Campbell from the Planning Department will start that off. Thank you. Um, I have a question too. Is there an appellant and why wouldn't the appellant been given, be given time? The appellant is the applicant and the applicant is the appellant. In fact, it's coming to you for original decision on certification of the EIR, so it's really not that kind of scenario. Mr. Mayor, members of the council, happy new year. Do I need to say the hearing is open, by the way? Nobody knows. It's open. Okay. Um, this is the McGonagall residence at uh, 2333 Pacific Drive. Um, this project has been reviewed by the Planning Commission and approved twice. It did come back for the, after the first approval by the uh, Planning Commission to the City Council on appeal. Council Member Gardner appealed it for the express purpose to ensure that the general plan was being adhered to. Uh, before the council could take action on that, uh, additional information came up that called into question the CEQA determinations, the uh, environmental review aspect. Um, so it was continued off calendar. After that, we decided that a, an EIR would be the most appropriate course of action here, and we uh, underwent and prepared that EIR. We have the consultant here this evening, Keaton Kreitzer, uh, who prepared the environmental document. Um, Subject property is at the corner of Begonia and Pacific Drive in Corona del Mar. It's outlined here. Uh, the area below there has been developed with two homes. This picture just captures when it was under construction, so there are two homes directly beneath the project site. There is some steep topography, and there's a close-up of today's uh, uh, imagery there. This is straight down. There's the two homes below. Uh, as you can see here from the topography, it is kind of a steeply sloping uh, site, um, and it's obviously adjacent to Begonia Park. <coughs> uh, I think I want to cut really to the chase. The question here for the council this evening is really whether or not the proposed residence is blocking the public view from the park, and whether or not this is a significant impact. Um, and also that determination relates to policies of the general plan that require uh, that the city evaluate a project uh, to see if it impacts the public view um, in, in, a, in a negative way. And so if this is deemed to be a significant impact on the view um, and uh, then again, that would be inconsistent with general plan policy. Now, the EIR does conclude that this is a less than significant impact. Uh, and that's principally because uh, the, the, the focal point of the view, the harbor area there is still remains, and it, less than half of the view is being impacted. Um, and then we also looked at this uh, impact in the broader context of the overall view. And this, this, um, this view angle here is basically approximating what you would see from the lower park bench. Um, with that, I think that's the question for the council to take a look at this evening is really whether or not this is a significant impact on the view. And if it is, then we can have a conversation as to what to do with that. Again, staff is recommending that uh, we certify the EIR, making a determination that it is not a significant impact on the view, and also, consist and also thereby consistent with the general plan policies to protect uh, the public view from the park. Um, so in essence, that's staff's recommendation. Uh, the applicant is here to uh, you know, showcase the project. We've got project plans, and obviously we've got this uh, simulation here for, for discussion purposes. So if you have any sp specific questions about the project, I'd be happy to try and answer those. Um, and with that, I'm done. Thank you. Questions? Mr. I, I do. Uh, two, two questions. I just want to verify uh, for our purposes and everyone here. When an EIR is prepared, the EIR is done at the behest of, paid for, and managed by the city. Is that correct? Uh, yes, it is paid for by the city, although the applicant uh, deposits those funds and reimburses it. Yes. But, but it is the city staff that manages that, selects the consultants, and uh, Absolutely. works regarding the, the uh, judgments that are made there. Yes. Okay, and then with regard to these views, this is the view from the park bench at the southern edge, um, what I would guess would be the southwestern edge of the park, right along Begonia. Yes, this is the closest park bench to the project right, site. Right. It, do you have view simulations from other vantage points in the park? Um, we do, however, those are in the EIR, and there is an issue with those. They really didn't depict the house correctly, nor did they depict the removal of the vegetation. So. Uh, once that was discovered in the response to comments uh, phase in responding to the public comments we got, we discovered the error and prepared this visual simulation, and this was done in, in October. So this is the only view simulation that I have that is 
what I consider to be uh, accurate and clearly shows the project site. So. And, and in the EIR, this was judged to have a roughly 35 percent view impairment from this vantage point. Roughly, yes. Now, Roughly. other vantage points are further away from the project site and you'd have, say, a different percentage and it would be likely less. It, it all depends on where you're standing. Well, that's one. my question. Did you, did you sort of spot view vantage points around the park? You can move north and then east across the top edge of the park and even to some extent down into the park. Uh, did, you can, did you, and we picked this vantage point because it's the closest and we felt would show the worst case scenario. In essence, other vantage points, the view is less impaired, so we wanted to show the worst case, and that was why this particular site was selected. Okay, thank you. Mr. Mayor, may I tee up some of the legal issues real quickly on this one as well? Yes. This is the second EIR that you have addressed since I've been the city attorney. The first one was the Airy Project. I wanted to and I did, but albeit not in the time frame that I wanted, to give you a background on what exactly you're doing when you're certifying EIR, what's your role, what are the standards from a legal perspective, and what's the nature of what we call substantial evidence. I provided that memo via email today, uh, and I apologize for not getting it to you sooner. In sum, however, when you certify an EIR, you're saying three things. One, the EIR was prepared consistent with CEQA which is a procedural statute to identify all environmental impacts that can be identified, mitigate those that can be mitigated, and if not all can be mitigated, then you can approve a project if you adopt a statement of overriding considerations, which is what you did on the Civic Center project when there was an unmitigatable impact. The other thing you're certifying is, is that the work that was performed on the EIR was the independent judgment of the city, which is what Council Member Hen was just asking about. While we charge a CEQA applicant for the actual fees. All the work is performed at the direction and at the request and under the supervision of your city staff. So it is an objective document that's prepared to fully analyze the environmental impacts. Thirdly, you're also certifying that you have considered these environmental impacts on whatever project determination that you make somewhere down the road. You can certify an EIR and still deny a project. So an EIR can be a sufficient document under CEQA and the project can be denied. Now, what you're faced with tonight is a question of whether or not, I mean, the core issue is whether or not there's a significant impact upon public views that needs to be mitigated. The EIR consultants, as concurred with by city staff and concurred by your planning commission, has con con concluded that the impact on public views is not significant so that it does not require further mitigation. It's already been mitigated to the level of insignificance under CEQA. But you're still the fact-finding body, and you are the body that acts in what we call a quasi-judicial uh, manner. You're making the determination of facts based upon the information you're presented in all the agenda packets and the EIR and all the testimony you hear tonight, and you make the decision whether, in fact, this is a significant impact upon public views. So you need to, as you would, I know, take into account all the testimony that's provided as well as all the documentation that's before you, and then ultimately you'll make a decision. In your decision, the question the courts will look at is whether there is substantial evidence to support the decision. Substantial evidence is that type of evidence that a reasonable person could rely upon. It's evidence that has foundation, so in other words, folks know what they're talking about. Uh, it's not speculation. In other words, it's not somebody who's just saying, well, I think this, this, and this, but has no basis for saying it. And it's expert opinion and expert opinion means someone who's qualified to render that opinion, an architect, say, for example, on, on architectural issues or an engineer on civil issues, uh, or individuals who can say that, in my opinion, because I live by there, I saw it, this is a substantial impact on your view. That's an opinion and a statement of fact by someone who has foundation. So those are the things you'll be considering tonight. Uh, and if you have any questions on the legal issues, please feel free to ask. Thank you, Mr. Hunt. Now I'd like to invite the applicant to the podium. 15 minutes, sir. Yes, thank you. Uh, my wife and I are here uh, before. Please state your name for the record, please. Kim McGonigal. Uh, my wife and I are here before you today to hopefully end one of the most unpleasant experiences of our lives. It began in August of 97 when my wife bought the legal parcel of land at 233 Pacific next to a wonderful and beautiful ocean and bay view. How exciting. 
There was a for sale sign on the property for months and my wife purchased the property through a broker from Coldwell Banker from the Griswold family. Everyone had an opportunity to buy this land. Buying a piece of property for a home is one of life's dreams and accomplishments. If the city didn't want to have a home on the parcel, then they should have zoned it for something other than a house. We began the process in 2007, started by going to the building and planning department to get their advice on how to build the house and what requirements we would have to meet. We were told we had a right to build and to enter on Pacific and that our lot didn't have access to Bayside, nor would the traffic department approve access from Bayside due to the dangers of the street and the curve. We next hired our fabulous architect, David Olson, and he also went to the city to discuss our project and get direction. We then drew up plans with everything we wanted in the house and determined it would require a variance to accomplish. We took the plans to the planning department to discuss and the planning department suggested that we take our plans to the planning commission to get the comments and ideas and not to ask for a vote, but to get rec recommendations. At that meeting, we took the advice of the planning commission and scaled back the design so that we would no longer require a variance, but only a modification for the planner at the front of the house for safety reasons. Our original plans called for a 4,500 square foot home. And at the suggestion of the planning commission, we reduced the size to 3,500. We went before the Planning Commission for the first time on April 3rd, 2008. Over the last two years, I personally met with every Planning Commissioner at the site or in their office. I've met with or discussed our project with every City Council member and incorporated every suggestion brought forth in our plans that were viable per my architect and engineers. We have redone the plans at least five times and have exhausted every opportunity to minimize the impact in Begonia Park. Additionally, we have granted a permanent view easement on the property that we will not plant trees or shoves on our patio uh, that would grow higher than our structure, reducing the view impact to the park. At the request of the Planning Commission, we installed story poles reflecting the maximum height per code and the lower height of our planned building structure. I believe this might be the first time that a single family home in Newport Beach has done this. The good news, our project was approved unanimously on August 21, 2008 by the Planning Commission. Several days later, our decision was appealed by Council Member Nancy Gardner, who stated, and I quote, that the appeal was to ensure consistency with the general plan. In 2006, when they created the, the Newport Beach general plan, the city had the opportunity to rezone the lot and didn't. Also, neither Begonia nor Pacific Streets are mentioned in the general plan as view quarters unlike Ocean Boulevard. Nowhere in the general plan does it say to deny a legal lot next to Begonia Park from being built, only to protect views where feasible. On September 23, 2008, we went before the City Council to address the appeal. The hearing was postponed because a letter surfaced stating that there might be a potential significant biological resource on our property that only blooms in the spring. It was then suggested that we prepare a negative deck declaration stating we would mitigate if any endangered biologicals were found, which none were. At this point, David Lipo, the planning director, suggested that a full environmental impact report would help his department determine whether or not they would recommend our project. How strange, in March of 2009, while our EIR was being done to determine if there were any significant biological plants present, the property directly adjacent to ours, the Begonia Park, gets totally defoliaged of plants that have been present for 35 years. The environmental impact report was completed and everything in the report sort of supported our project. No significant impacts in any area from a neutral, unbiased consultant selected by the city. On October 22, 2009, we were presented, we presented the EIR for approval to the Planning Commission. The day of the hearing, the Planning Director determined that he wasn't certain if the visual simulations were accurate. He postponed our planning commission meeting for 30 days to make absolutely certain they were correct. On November 19, 2009, our EIR and project were again approved unanimously by the planning commission. I've been told that this project has been through more scrutiny than any single family home ever in Newport Beach, and it has passed every test at least twice at the planning department and the planning commission. It is now three years since we started this approval process, 
and we respectively, respectfully request a final determination tonight. My wife and I have asked that you please protect the property rights of all citizens who have purchased property in Newport Beach. On behalf of my wife, Carolyn, and myself, I'd like to thank you for your time, your service, and your consideration. And I'd like to have David Ar Olson, our architect, make a short presentation. Thank you. Hi, my name is David Olson. I'm the architect for the project. And we're going to run a short video here. Um, I think it's unfortunately going to be a little redundant with some of Mr. Campbell's earlier comments and some of uh, Mr. McGonigal's as well. But at this point, there's no way to rework it. But it should stay within the time frame. Thank you. consists of sloping topography from Pacific Drive down to the lower property lines. It is landlocked on all sides and requires access through the public right-of-way off of Pacific Drive, which is similar to other homes on Pacific. The site has established building development requirements of a 5-foot front setback, 4-foot side setbacks, and a 10-foot rear setback. The established height limit on the site is 24 feet. The established gross buildable area allowed on this site is 1.5 times the buildable area. The site meets the terms and conditions of Categorical Exclusion Order E77-5, and therefore a coastal development permit is not required. The general plan categorizes this site as RSD, which is a single unit residential detached. The zoning code categorizes this site as R1, which is single family residential. This site was earmarked by the city for a single family home when the McGonagall's purchased it. Neither the new general plan nor the zoning code have altered that designation. In the fall of 2007, we presented our first scheme to the planning department. That scheme applied to the size requirements and setback requirements, but was seeking a height variance similar to others that were granted on Pacific Drive. After several meetings with staff, we were asked to reconsider our scheme to protect the views from adjacent Upper Begonia Park we were guided towards considering a solution that redistributed square footage away from the primary view corridor towards less critical areas, even if that meant setback or height variances. In particular, we were guided towards a solution that encroached on the front setback and pushed the house to the right because excessive height in that area would be out of the view corridor. We prepared a revised scheme to and presented that to staff. Staff was still concerned about the impact to the park views and was sensitive to what they thought would be neighborhood concerns about the view. The planning director felt that the prudent thing to do would be to present the project to the planning commission for direction. On April 3rd, we presented the revised scheme and the planning commission reviewed the submittal and heard public comment. They had several concerns, including the view from the park, bulk of the structure from below, and the compatibility with the existing development in the neighborhood. They had numerous comments for direction. They assessed the option of accessing the site from Bayside, and after discussion, determined that the only viable access to the site was off of Pacific Avenue. They also determined that Begonia Avenue does not have a coastal view road designation in the general plan, and therefore view issues would be limited to views from the park. Views from Begonia Avenue, including views from the sidewalk immediately in front of the site, could not be considered. They determined that the bluff was already degraded and therefore they preferred additional alteration of the landform in order to minimize the impact of the view from the park. They also asked that story poles be placed on the site. Given these comments and others, we redesigned the project again and submitted revised Scheme 3, which is in front of you tonight. 
Scheme 3 is a radical redesign that removes the entire top floor as viewed from Pacific so that the street scene is single story. The square footage is reduced and redistributed down the slope as suggested by the Commission. Revised Scheme 3 eliminates all requests for setback variances for the structure, and more importantly, it complies with the 24-foot height standards for the site, so we eliminated the request for a height variance. The Planning Department reviewed the project and in a formal staff report concluded that the project was consistent with a residential design criteria ordinance and general plan policies pertaining to public views protection, neighborhood compatibility, and landform alteration. Scheme 3 was formally heard by the Planning Commission at their August 21st hearing. After reviewing the project and hearing public comment, the Planning Commission unanimously approved the project by a vote of 7 to 0. They felt that substantial changes were made and that we respected the direction they had given us. Each commissioner voting for the project acknowledged that they had visited the site and viewed the story poles that had been erected. We feel it is important to review certain significant comments made during that hearing. Commissioner Torch noted that making a determination of consistency with the general plan means the whole plan, and part of that plan allows building a house on an R1 lot. Commissioner McDaniel noted that we have mitigated everything we could within the rules and the standards. It was his opinion that these people have earned the right to build on their property. Commissioner Unsworth noted that when Ordinance 2007-03 was passed, the zoning code that created the envelope was in existence. Commissioner Hawkins noted that the site is owned by a private party who has a right under the general plan and zoning code. After the first planning commission approval, Council Member Gardner appealed the decision to ensure consistency with the general plan, and the project was remanded back to the planning commission for recommendation to Council. During the appeal period, a concern was raised that a rare plant may exist on the site. The Chambers Group was hired, and they determined that no federal or state-sensitive species were observed during the survey. Also, during the appeal period, the City determined that the project warranted an environmental impact report. This report was prepared by Keaton Kreitzer Consulting, and they determined that project implementation will not result in significant impacts from an important vantage point identified in the natural resources element of the general plan. After the EIR was prepared and the comment period was met, the Planning Commission reviewed the project for a second time, and again, in the unanimous vote of 7-0, to zero, they recommended approval of the project. Commissioner Torch noted how difficult it is to protect views, but where, but where do you draw the line? There's a balance, but not enough to restrict someone from building a home. <coughs> During the meeting, alternate access from Bayside was discussed. Multiple reasons prevent this from being an option, including safety due to site distance, relocation of utilities, giving up parkland, and extremely difficult access to livable areas due to site topography. Public Works also noted that they do not support an additional driveway through the park or shared use of the existing driveway. An alternative design was also discussed in which the entire upper level would be omitted, which includes the entry into the home as well as the garage. Multiple reasons prevent this as an option, including an enclosed garage space is required by code, lack of an enclosed garage space would require a variance, and therefore the project would then need to go to Coastal Commission. And the Commission noted that a garage is just typical of a home. To date, Kim and Caroline McGonigal have done everything the City has asked of them. They have agreed to multiple design revisions, they have placed story poles on the site, they have hired a biologist, they have obtained an environmental impact report, which is one of the first times this has been done in Newport Beach for, for a single family dwelling, and that they have even agreed to place a legal view restriction on future development. Additionally, they went door to door and personally presented the original project to their neighbors. All they ask for tonight is a reasonable right to build on their property. The City Planning Department recommended approval of this project, and the Planning Commission has twice, unanimously, in a 7-0 vote, also approved this project. We respectfully ask you to endorse those approvals tonight.
Thank you very much. Are there any questions for the uh, applicant at this point in time? Okay, seeing none, then I will invite the audience, uh, residents who would like to speak on this matter to come to the podium. Uh, please state your name and uh, in consideration of the other people in the audience, please limit your comments to three minutes. Thank you. Yes, sir, good evening. Thank you, my name is Ken Jaggers. I live at 516 Begonia, Granite Del Mar. If the applicants submitted plans for a residence that conformed to the Newport Beach General Plan, they would already be living in their homes. This delay happened because the Newport Beach General Plan requires city officials to protect and where feasible to enhance public views. After review of the project, the Planning Commission stated that a 35% loss of view from Begonia Park is acceptable. Over 1,200 residents disagree with that assessment. Here is another 300 petitions signed from residents to add to the 900 we've already given you. We have no problem with Mr. McGonigal with most of his proposed house. We oppose only the garage. It's a small part of the house, but it's the part that obscures the Begonia Park view. Now, 150 residents posted signs that protest the loss of view. Contrary to what Mr. McGonigal has inferred right now, almost every resident in that community has posted signs against that. Pacific Coast Highway businesses are also concerned, and they've posted signs. We asked the city council to consider this option for the house, moving the garage entrance down to Bayside Drive. The proposed house must comply with the general plan, or otherwise you're going to be alienating the population of the area. Granting an encroachment into public view would also create a precedent that would seriously undermine implementation of the general plan. Prudence, forethought, and common sense dictate that this precedent-setting action must not occur, otherwise you're going to be inundated with requests in the future. Granting a variance from the general plan would put the city in an untenable position. Remember, over 1,200 petitioners disagree in writing with the Planning Commission. We asked the City Council to return the request for variance to the Planning Commission. We asked the City Council to issue instructions that future submissions comply with the general plan. Of course the applicants should be allowed to build on their lot, but they should be allowed to build on their lot only as long as their home conforms to the general plan and does not encroach into the public view. They should not be allowed latitude that other citizens don't have. Thank you for your time. Next speaker, please. Yes, I have a flash drive for, um, I don't know who has it, but. Can someone assist the speaker with the computer? Um, Why don't you have the next speaker come out while they're loading that in? Sure, and if you, if you wouldn't mind, let the next person come up while Jim loads you up there. So, somebody can come on up. Please state your name. My name is Mike Gainer. I've uh, lived in this town for 35 to 40 years, raised three boys here, now have eight grandchildren, have watched innumerable people try to build a house in this town, and I have never seen someone go through what the McGonagall's have gone through. When I heard the story, I went up to the park and checked it out. You couldn't see the water from the park. Somewhere along the line of this going back and forth, someone got the city to cut down the bushes substantially so you could finally see some view of the bay. Before that, none of those neighbors seemed to mind not being able to see the bay. But once they saw a house going up, they decided to fight it, and so they had the city cut, I assume, had the city cut back the bushes and said, look, that house is going to interfere with our view. I, like I said, I've lived here, I've loved this city, and I personally find it offensive that some group of citizens is putting someone through this much trouble that has really tried to play by the rules and do things as, the, as all the various <coughs> bodies in this town want. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. get this up or not. My name is Ann Balderston, and um, my family's uh, been homeowners in Corona Del Mar for, well, since 1936. 
So we've kind of watched uh, what's gone on with this beautiful view. What we're trying to get up here are these pictures, which I'll just give them to you. And on the back of two of them are, are dates. One is for 1983, and one is for 1973. This was in the Los Angeles Times. And um, that's to show that the bench is sitting on the public sidewalk there, that there was a bench there at one time, and that bench was donated by our family in memory of my grandmother. And um, the city maintained the bench, um, and the city basically took responsibility for the bench once we had placed it there. And um, my point being that that was considered a public view. That's why the bench was placed there, looking out over the bay and the ocean. And this has always been a much valued public view for everyone in the community, not just the people that live around there. And um, I think it was rather an arbitrary decision made by the Planning Commission to only protect a portion of the view from the park. Because what will happen if this garage is built there is that the entire view from that viewpoint will be obliterated. You won't be able to see anything. And um, uh, I just wanted to say that this is not about trying to um, take anything, anything from Mr. and Mrs. McGonigal or, or trying to um, deprive them of their right to build on the lot. Um, we all care about our property rights and respect their property rights. but. I would just hope that we can find a creative solution to this situation where both parties can feel good about it and where this beautiful view that is really a gem in our community can be preserved. Um, I've seen a whole group of Japanese exchange students down there brought there by their teacher to see the beautiful view. Um, members of the uh, fire department even sit down there, the police department sit down there to enjoy the view while they're having their lunch. Um, it is used by no end of people in the community. Uh, this past summer there was uh, a neighbor that had a wonderful community gathering in the park um, that was kind of a belated Fourth of July party and she had musicians come in and everyone from the community came and it was just a wonderful event. I see you looking at me, Keith. <laughs> time, time is up, I'm afraid. Okay. All right. Well, thank you so much for, for letting me speak. Thank you very much. Next speaker, please. My name is Dan Splitter. I live at 430 and a half Begonia in Corona del Mar and have for over 30 years now. I'm also co-chairman of Friends of Begonia Park. By the way, I didn't know that our Parks Department was so lax in trimming bushes that it's taken 35 years to get bushes trimmed in the park. Is that true? Because we've been trying probably for 35 years to get those doggone bushes trimmed, and finally they reacted, coincidentally, to the time that uh, Mr. McGonagall wants to get pictures of his lot taken. Well, one of the things we want to think about is that if a home has a value, a view, I should say, and that view has changed, then obviously there's a loss of value to that home. An appraiser can tell us what that loss of value is. And I submit to you that if a park loses a significant part of its view, and by no means is 35% an insignificant amount. We had testimony from two statisticians at the Planning Commission hearing, one with the PhD in, in uh, statistics. I submit to you if you reduce 35%, but the view loss, the water view loss is not 35%, it's 50 to 60%. If you hold your hands up here, you can see when we go back to that other chart, when there were the two uh, visualizations of a home appeared, that when the uh, garage was there and the garage was not there, well, if you look, you can clearly measure that 50% of the water view was lost with this garage. Now, do we have to have a garage that has a water view? I don't, I don't know that this is a right that someone has to have, correct? 
Now, if the council votes, and I understand you might, that this lost view should go to the applicant, the value of this lost view, then actually you're making a donation from the park, which loses value, to the applicant who gains value from being able to disturb the view of this park. That doesn't seem right to me either. Now, I try to find out from different people in the uh, real estate business, how much would this actually, this value be that is being lost if it got appraised? And our professional appraisers who can't determine such things on public sites. I heard comments anywhere from several hundred thousand dollars to millions of dollars. I have no idea what that value would be, but certainly you're, de you're devaluing the park by at least several hundred thousand dollars. Is that something we should be doing, devaluing our public assets? I mean, this is a serious point. We're devaluing a public asset. We're giving that, that uh, loss in value to a private citizen to use for his, public, his private benefit. That doesn't sound right to me. I don't know, is it even legally right? Maybe the attorney can speak to this point at some, at some time tonight. But it just seems like on behalf of the over 1,200 people who have uh, asked through signing their petition and the over 150 people who have put up yard signs and signs in front of their businesses protesting this uh, development, and the many thousands of people, thousands and thousands of people who will use this in the future, we should not go forward with this proposal as it now appears before us. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Yes, my name's Walter Cruttenden. I live at 2209 Pacific Drive. And uh, when our house was built, it was put below the bluff to preserve views. And one of the objections of the applicant here, who I, I greatly sympathize with, was that <coughs> it would be very uh, difficult to put a garage down below and he wouldn't have his uh, Pacific Drive address. And I wanted to say that uh, even though our garage uh, is down below on Bayside Drive, we had to do that in order to keep the views above, uh, we still have our address at Pacific Drive. So it, it can be done. Um, also down below, um, it should be noted that uh, one of the objections was the, uh, the traffic issues. And we checked the, uh, the accident records and could find uh, no report of any accidents in that particular area there. The only one uh, we found that was close was down at the corner where uh, Carnation intersects uh, Bayside, and that was a pedestrian accident. Also, um, if the city wished to, to protect this view, it could go to a number of uh, different measures, including allowing access on the existing encroachment agreement, which the house down below on Bayside uses. Um, maybe you could pass this around. You can see that the, the garage uh, uses a driveway that goes right across park land, and the back of that driveway goes right up next to the McGonagall property. And here is, uh, that is currently subject to an encroachment agreement. Here's a copy of the encroachment agreement, which grants the city the right to let anybody else use that, that driveway for access. And it'd be a perfect solution to this problem just to either use the existing driveway or expand the driveway a little bit. And let me mention one point on utilities because that was brought up as a, uh, a concern. Uh, I know a fair bit about engineering. I was on the uh, board of the Keith Companies, the largest engineering firm in the county here. And I uh, went down there and looked at that, and the only uh, significant utilities there uh, to move are, are the television and cable. You don't have the, the gas going in there, the, the sewer is underground. It's really a very easy situation if for some reason you don't want to uh, access through the existing driveway, if you want to just move another driveway there or expand that drive to go in where the bushes are. And finally, uh, here's a picture of the, the bushes on the lower part of the uh, driveway. Uh, the driveway's on the other side, on the lower part of the park. And I don't think any citizen would mind you giving up a little bit of those bushes. It's not even any of the grass part of the park.
to accommodate a driveway and a very nice garage. And in fact, he could even go two stories there if he wanted and uh, have even a bigger house than he has approved, than he has proposed. Anyway, thank you for your time. Next speaker, please. Good evening. Uh, my name is Dwayne Campbell. I'm a 25-year resident of Newport Beach. We moved here from Utah for the beautiful views and the great location. We always dreamed of living in Newport Beach. When we first moved here, we lived on Lido Island, where the, every 10 or 15 houses, there's a little view court or a little park out to the bay, and we loved it. There was also some homes that hadn't been built on the perimeter of the, of the island there, and uh, essentially we got to borrow their view. In the next number of years, people started to build on those lots. I didn't believe that we were entitled to keep our view. We just borrowed the view. I don't believe that, that these neighbors on Begonia are entitled to keep their view because this is really about their view. The Begonia Park, I mean, I've got six kids and a dog, and we've used it lots of times. We go down after we go to Brugger's on Sunday mornings. We walk down. We sit on the park. We, we see the view. My view is not going to be significantly impacted. I may have to move 20 or 30 feet to the side there. I'm still going to get the same view. I think this is really about uh, property rights. It's about this, this family being allowed to build on their property that they legally and lawfully bought with the intent of building a home at some point, They're, they should be entitled to build. We're all they're just borrowing the views, and quite honestly, they're no more entitled to them than, uh, than the people that actually own the property. Thank you very much. Next speaker. Hi, my name is Katie Takis, and um, I'm over 11 years. Uh, I've been a resident owner for over 11 years in Corona Del Mar. Um, I'd like to again raise the concern regarding um, going against the Newport General Plan. Uh, will it set precedents? Um, if if it's okay to do that, then you know possibly I'd like to build my garage and enclose it. You know, is, am I going to be able to come in with with that proposition? Um, the second point I'd like to raise is when we purchased our property in Corona Del Mar. We were willing to pay more for a lot south of PCH and close to Begonia Park. The additional value was due to the ocean and harbor views from the grassy plot being within a short walking distance from our home. If you encroach on this view, you encroach on our property values as the perceived value goes down. As you know, many realtors tout Begonia Park as a selling point of the real estate in the area. What is the city prepared to do regarding the lowered perceived value of each home in the vicinity? Um, the perceived value takes me to the November 19th meeting notes that were online. And um, Mr. Olson, the architect, had uh, it was noted that uh, it would devalue Mr. McGonigal's property by not having an enclosed parking space. And regarding property values, I'm wondering, you know, how is it equitable for all the residents within the vicinity for their property values to go down? but we're more concerned about one property value, maintaining its stature, having a two-car enclosed garage. And um, it was also in the November 19th meeting, uh, Mr. Olson had noted that a rooftop parking violates the city requirements um, to have a two-car enclosed garage. I propose that we do possibly go after variance for that rather than encroaching on the public view uh, of so many residents. And in concluding, I'd like to say that Mr. McGonigal deserves to build and live in as beautiful a home as he can provide for himself and his family, but not at the cost of his neighbors, his neighborhood, and his community, and not with preferential treatment. At the end of all this, we are a community, and we will be living together in this great village of ours. I'd like to be able to welcome Mr. McGonigal and his family to this wonderful neighborhood with knowing that he was willing to be a part of us rather than apart from us. Thank you. Thank you. Let, let me say I know that this is an emotional issue for both sides of the issue, so if we could, it's been a very civil discussion tonight. If we could uh, restrain from applause and that kind of thing, thank you. Yes, ma'am. Hi, my name is Karen Fleming. I live on Begonia Avenue, and I'm a 30-year resident of Corona Del Mar and my name is proudly etched under the t um, clock tower. Um, I, my home in Corona Del Mar 
when I bought it, had the sweetest view of the bay, the harbor, the pavilion, the sunset, the horizon. A developer came in and built um, a house that blocked all of my view, which devalued my house. Um, I was told when I called city officials that I had no right um, and the developer was, I had no private rights. So I walked since then every day, three times a day, my dog to the Bogonia Park for the view. I love it. I love it. I have a view. And the hard time I have is all the information that I've been receiving about the master plan and protecting the public view, which is hugely different than the private view. And we're looking at a garage versus three-fourths of the public view of the harbor, the bay, from Begonia Park. And the problem with me is that it's a garage and there's an alternative. They can build their house and they can bring the garage in directly below their house on Bayside. If an elevator from the top goes down, the elevator from the bottom goes up. It's the same. And they don't have to take any view and still have their entire house. And they can come in from an existing driveway or that's an encroachment that the city's already given away, or I'd be happy for you to give away another bit of the lower park for them to come in down below on Bayside and keep the public view intact from Begonia Park. Nancy is one of our sweetest treasures. For me, you described the, the Corona Del Mar Library that way in your interview on Channel 3. For me, the Begonia Park view is one of our sweetest treasures. Thank you. Thank you. Next, please. Good evening. My name is Tom Takis. I've been a member of the community for about 12, 13 years now. Um, Speak up, Tom. And I would just like to say that um, sight is probably one of the most precious gifts that we're ever given. And once you lose it, it's gone. And one of the questions that I would ask everybody here is that if a person came up to you and said that you were going to lose 35% of your sight, would you consider that to be insignificant? I'm not sure how the process works and what is the rule that says what is significant and what is not significant, but 35% seems awfully significant to me as a member of this community. And I'm hoping that all of you can help preserve and protect uh, the site of this community as opposed to giving it to an, uh, one individual at the expense of the community. Thank you. My name is John Clark and I uh, have a resident on Acacia Avenue, 608 to be exact. Uh, I think I beat everybody here as far as longevity. My great-grandfather entered California in July of 1847 and raised the first American flag in Pueblo de Los Angeles. So I go back a ways as far as the family's concerned. A little levity helps here. Uh, I sympathize with the McGonagall's and their attempt to build a, a home in a most wonderful place. Uh, we have had homes uh, since 1936 in uh, Newport area. My wife and family have lived in uh, Corona del Mar since 1974. Our daughter was married in Begonia Park because of the beauty of the park and the view and all. She wanted to be married on the beach. We said, no, the grandparents wouldn't handle the sand very well. <laughs> Make a long story short, that view is precious. Now, 35% loss, 33% loss, whatever the figure is, I'm sorry to say, is going to have a significant impact upon the park. Um, just the other night, my wife and I went down and sat and watched the sunset. As many of you may be aware, we've had some beautiful sunsets lately, 
And that's one of the things that we enjoy doing is taking our dog down, sitting and watching the sunset over Catalina. You will no longer see that same sunset. It will be gone. Uh, we sat there with several other members who just of the community who happened to show up and uh, discussed a little bit. And everybody was pretty much of the same mind that the beauty of Begonia Park is the view. It is the only park in Corona Del Mar that the residents really get to use. If you look at the other park uh, spaces, you will find that it is the visitors to Corona Del Mar that come in on the weekends and take them over. You can't even park near them. Uh, so as a consequence, I think this particular park is a real jewel. And I would uh, ask that the council consider the fact that if there are some alternatives to save that view, let's try to do our best to accomplish it. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. My name is Larry Tucker, and I'm here tonight to speak in support of the Planning Commission's decision on Mr. McGonagall's application. I spent over seven years on the Planning Commission, including the time frame in which the new general plan was envisioned, debated, processed, and adopted. The Commission is not a political body. The Commission's charge is to make judgments on applications based upon facts presented and the policies of the city. Those are the policies that are set forth in the ordinances and general plan which have been adopted by your City Council and other official pronouncements of the City Council. The Planning Commission does not and should not decide matters based upon how many people show up and how many petitions are signed. In the case of Mr. McGonigal, the, commission's, the Commission unanimously supported his application. Not one of the Commissioners said no. The land is zoned and general plan for its proposed use. Some may have opinions as to the wisdom of those land use entitlements, but I'm confident that the Council will see its job to rule on an application based upon the current state of the law, not what some or even many may wish it were. The essence of your decision tonight rests upon the opponent's claim that the general plan protects public views, an argument which I believe does not apply in this case. The land use designation has superiority over a policy. There is nothing in the general plan that states that a zoned and general plan lot cannot be built on if there is a view from an adjoining public property such as a park or a road. If that were the case, what would happen if an old house were torn down to make way for a new one? While the lot was cleared but before new construction began, would a just created public view give rise to a conclusion that the lot couldn't be built on because of that created public view? And what if a waterfront house were demolished but because of market conditions was not built on for many years. Would that give rise to a new public view? Should it matter that an existing lot has never been built on if it always could have been? The general plan says, quote, the land use element is the final arbiter of how, city, how the city of Newport Beach shall evolve, close quote. I certainly did not vote for a general plan that took away a person's right to build on a pre-existing general plan and zoned lot, and I doubt if any of you who were on the council at that time thought you were doing so either. But if you decide that the view policy supersedes the land use designation, and that's really what we're talking about here, there's a conflict in many circumstances that, that will confront you over the years, then you will have created a problem when, for instance, someday the windows on the bay parcel arrives on your doorstep and a different group of citizens insists that it is your duty to protect and enhance the Mariner's Mile view corridor first and foremost and to therefore leave the windows on the bay parcel the way that it is today, regardless of the land use rights that were granted to its property owner in that same general plan. I'm sure there will be other development opponents that will make the same argument on other properties throughout the city. You have a conflict here, and I believe that the land use designation uh, is superior because nobody's asking for a general plan amendment or a zone change in this particular case. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Tucker. Okay, both, both sides now. Hi, yes, good sir. evening. My name is Scott, last name Juarez. I moved on Begonia, and it really takes a lot for me to get involved with anything. Um, I looked at it, thought it's just a house. I don't know the gentleman. I wish him the best. I hope he builds a beautiful home. What's interesting is you're taking time from your families. Everybody here is taking time from their family. Think about this. In Corona Del Mar, you've got all these people that band together. There's got to be a reason why. Now, my grandparents bought the very first house on Carnation for $5,000. A 
okay? Didn't have a garage at the time. All of a sudden, it was when I was growing up, it was neighborhood. I move on to Begonia. Two of my neighbors have my house key. This is, people know who you are. People talk to you. You go down the street to the park, and there's people with their dogs. I mean, it's real. It's real community. And what you have here is you have community. Nothing against this man. I hope he builds, like I said, a beautiful home. Mr. Hunt asks you to look at the letter of the law. Well, there's two points here. You have an issue at hand of people that say build a home, and if you put it back his drawing or rendering up there, take a look at the park and where the original bench used to be. Then you look at his rendering and you look at story poles, but story poles aren't walls. Now, it's a real simple concept here. He should be able to build a home. He has every right. But how significant is a view? Now, do any of you live on Begonia? Do any of you have residents that congregate together, that share together, that come out? Everybody would love to welcome him. The difference is I've been accepted by just beautiful people who I didn't know and who all of a sudden now, it's, it's, it's like a mini little family on that street. That's what you have here. You don't have people that are rising up saying, look, we don't want the gentleman, we don't want this. What it pertains to is the view. Is the view by Mr. Hunt's definition, by the letter of the law, is it significant? You really need to look into your heart and ask yourself where you live. When you go home tonight, how many of your neighbors have your house key? How many of your neighbors know you? Do you have a view? What's important to you? He needs to build a home. That's a given. That's his right. But can there be a compromise where everyone seems to win? And there is a, there is a point down below. Perfect. You got a chance, to, you know, where you can accommodate Mr. McGonnell, you can accommodate the people, you got the view, it's a win. But you as a group have to come together and say, is this significant? That's all I really have to say. I want to thank you for your time. Thank you, sir. Hi, my name is Julie Sherwin, and I am one of the Begonians. Um, and I'm going to um, <laughs> mention, I have a, a colleague or a friend that, with which I work, and some of you may know him. He's been in the um, area for a long time, Ron Yo, and he's a local architect, FAIA, which um, gives itself a kind of a prestigious level with among architects. And a couple things that were mentioned tonight um, kind of contradict what um, he had sent me in an email that he forwarded, I believe, maybe to you, Nancy, but definitely to the Planning Commission. And what the email said, and he was on the original task force for the general plan, so I really give what he has to say a lot of merit because he was there. And one of the things he had was a, a visual of the area that designated Begonia Park, and not just the park, but also the corridor of Begonia Avenue as view, which kind of is a little bit different than what I had heard. But since he was there, I give it a lot of merit, and I'm sure he would be happy to forward his email to you. He also signed the petition. He's also a local resident. But he, in this email, also noted that he was not, he felt that the EIR was not in compliance with the general plan and upholding what it was in place for, which was to protect our community, to protect what views we have um, in, in order to really enhance our, our experience in this wonderful area, which we are very all fortunate to live. Um, as was mentioned by a gentleman before me, you know, there are weddings there, there are a lot of activities that take advantage. I know we do every Thanksgiving. We go down to that corner um, to look at that view. And, and just as other people had said, we do feel everybody has a right to build on their property. We just hope that there is a way to compromise uh, and, and hopefully find some way to, uh, to make it work uh, where that garage could go down below. I think a key word that was said by um, the gentleman prior uh, was in the Planning Commission passing, uh, you know, and letting it go through was judgment. And I think that, you know, the judgment is, you know, 35% to the, to the Planning Commission is insignificant. But if you listen or if you ask some of your um, community residents, I think it's significant. Um, thank you for your time. Thank you. Are there any other speakers? Please come forward.
Good evening. Good evening. My name is Jeff Woodman. I live at 600 Begonia Avenue, and uh, I've lived there for 15 years, and I'm also a business owner in Corona Del Mar. I would just like to add one thing, and that is when you look at the park, there is only a certain portion of the park that is level. That portion that is level is what basically looks right out at the view corridor and what will look out at the garage. The rest of the park slopes down. It's pretty difficult to go there to use it uh, where you could picnic or you could sit down with a chair or to enjoy anything. So it's that top portion of the park that is really, really critical. And I'd like you to consider that when you look at the applicant's picture of the home and the garage that he wants to build. Thank you. Thank you, sir. My name is John Schaefer. I've been a resident of Irvine Terrace, the next community, for 23 years. Um, just listening to all this tonight, I've, I've heard about this, seen it in the news. Sometimes I wonder if we're living in the same community. And, and by the way, I'm not a begonia. Um, so um, I go by the park constantly. It's one of my favorite jogging routes to go by there. And you know, there are three parks in our immediate neighborhood, and I consider that the neighborhood. One of which, and I should have looked the names of them up, is the Irvine Terrace Park with its athletic fields and big picnics and a lot of activity. And then, of course, there's the wonderful huge park on top of big, big Corona and all the people and the weddings and all that. So if you want a view, you go there. But, you know, I have been going by this park for 23 years, and I almost never see anybody in the park, even on the weekends. I'm sorry. Okay. There, okay let's, the let's, park is not, is not really heavily used. All right. And, and all right. Ladies, ladies, I'm not talking about walking around on the top of the let, let's, let's be courteous to all of the speakers, all right. please. They've, they've, it's been a very civil discussion. Let's continue right. to keep it that way. Go ahead. Certainly sir. not as compared to the other parks. So I, I'm, uh, that's my observations. And when people are there, they tend to be down in the lower portion of, of the park, contrary to what this gentleman said. Now, I'm not talking about people walking around up on the street. So I just, I find what we're really hearing from is a lot of people who live up on Begonia and the adjacent streets who have homes or units there that have up to two stories, and we're talking about their view. That's what we're talking about. So I would also hope that this wise body makes a decision tonight and doesn't put these poor people through another six months or a year or another whatever. It's time to make a decision and, and to get on with this. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Mark Simon. I live, reside at 2420 First Avenue, right across the street from the park that's the subject of tonight's discussion. Uh, I haven't lived in Newport Beach very long. I've only owned my house for 20 years. But I've lived there for the last 20 years, and I've observed the park every single day. And uh, I disagree with the last speaker. I think the park is very heavily used, uh, especially the flat portion of the park is used for parties, birthday parties, weddings, all sorts of social occasions. There's probably something going on there just about every weekend. One thing that I haven't heard anybody mention about uh, this evening is uh, you're all talking about the 35% view loss from the flat area of the park. And, and to me, I think it's ludicrous that anybody could say that 35% view loss is, is insignificant. 35% of anything is significant. But if you go to the corner of First Incarnation, the opposite corner, and you look down the view corridor through the alley of trees where Carnation Boulevard used to go, which is now the portion of the park that slopes down to the water, you can see quite clearly from the story polls that 100% of the water view is blocked by the applicant's proposed structure. That means 100% from the corner of First Incarnation. And as you walk down to the sandbox and the first picnic bench where most folks uh, go to have their picnic with a view, that view will be completely lost 100% for all time if a decision to mitigate is not made here tonight. 
I don't I haven't heard a single person bring that subject up. 35% is surely significant. 100% is definitely significant. And 100% of the view loss is what you what you get, public view. People are not here complaining about their private view. Nobody in Newport Beach has a right to a private view. We all know that. Most people who live in the flower streets of Corona Del Mar do not have a view. They come to the public resource, Begonia Park, to enjoy the public view. And all the people are asking is that we find some kind of compromise. Nobody wants to keep the applicant from building his house. Most of the citizens don't object to 90% of the applicant's house. I think most of the citizens would like to see the city council take up the alternative design scenario, which the city staff's own report from October of this year says achieves all of the applicant's design objectives, but eliminates the 805 square foot top floor and retains the public view. You can come in from Bayside Drive. It's a no-brainer. Thank you, Mr. Simon. Are there any other speakers? Yes, ma'am. Well, thank you for your service. And uh, uh, my name is Laura Catalino, um, own property in Newport Beach. Um, unfortunately, the city or the residences of the Newport Beach didn't purchase this parcel three years ago, five years ago, ten years ago. It is zoned for a residence. As the gentleman um, from a former planning commission said, that the building rights supersede the view corridor. Um, I believe the McGonagall should be allowed to continue with their project. Um, I was at the last planning department meeting and they rejected um, bringing the entrance down from Bayside. And it was also my understanding from my takeaway from that meeting is that the master plan does not protect all views in the greater Newport Beach area. So thank you for your time. Thank you. Next speaker, please. My name is Robert San Miguel, 221 Carnation. You know, this great country was founded on property rights. And especially if you own a piece of property and you comply with the parameters set out by the community, in this case, the city of Newport Beach. This gentleman should be able to build his home and special interests should not prevail. Thank you, sir. Hi, my name is Joanne, and I live at 2323 Bayside, which ma'am? is right at the bottom. Joanne, can you give us your last name, please? Swig. Thank you. W E I G. Thank you. And we live at the bottom, at the park, where that racetrack on Bayside, when you come around the hill, it's the big yellow house. And we all live 10 feet from each other on Bayside, and we all get along very well because a we respect each other, and b when you're when you're living that close together you have to learn how to get along and I just don't understand and I a don't live here all the time and B I wasn't really paying attention to any of this but I have in the last couple of weeks been reading up and I just don't understand why somebody would want to continue with a plan that's gonna piss everybody off I mean I walk my cat to my neighbor's house she has my keys. I mean, we are, like that guy said, we are a very tight, close community. And I'm not saying that anything is going to, you know, erupt and there's going to be like big riots and protests, at least not from me. But I just don't understand why he can't change his plans a little bit so that everybody can just get along. I, I know that's from a movie, Why Can't We Get Along? But I, 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 honestly, I, I, just don't, I, I just don't understand what this whole, why he's digging his feet in. That's all. Thank you, ma'am. Any other speakers? Hi, I'm Suzanne Kai. I'm a longtime uh, homeowner at Corona Del Mar. And I totally agree with the last uh, many of the residents. Um, I am one of those people that got married in that park. I'm a working journalist, and one of my friends is a columnist from the Orange County Register. I could have gotten married anywhere in the world, any spot in the world, Paris, London, anywhere. Where did I get married? I, I got married right in front of that garage. <laughs> 
So I just wanted to uh, say that I'm a real live person, got married there, uh, despite the other, uh, the other person who said uh, there's not a lot of activity. Plus, the other thing is Corona Del Mar is extremely special, and we're not just saying that. I lost a pet bird, and I'll make this quick. A little pet bird, and I, I just posted a little sign on a telephone pole, and within about two hours, there must have been 50 people people I haven't really met before, some of them with binoculars going around the neighborhood trying to find my pet bird. End of story, they found my pet bird in a tree and, and uh, she's home. So that's it. Good. <laughs> Thank you. I love it when we get to the catharsis part. Thank you. Well, another speaker? Yes, sir. Um, Michael Rogan, live on Acacia Street, have for a long time. And um, in the presentations, there was the <clears throat> view of the proposed structure blocking the view from well back from the boundary of Begonia Park, which is actually adjacent to Mr. McGonigal's lot. So if, if we're going to protect the public asset from, you know, encroachment on the view from the park, shouldn't the, we also consider the view which would have been three feet up from Mr. McGonigal's lot uh, near the tree that's prominent in the picture. And from that vantage point, there is no view. The garage usurps the whole thing. And so all these people who have opted to present a reasonable alternative should be given due consideration. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your uh, patience. I'm uh, Peter Denniston, resident of Newport Beach. Uh, submitted comments uh, in support of the application to all the uh, council members and, and Mr. Mayor. Uh, I won't repeat those comments again for sake of time. I will make a comment, though, that I've heard that, that uh, there is an encroachment permit to public view, a variance to general plan that's required. As I understand, what's being asked of by the applicant is due by right. There's no variance no encroachment permits, nothing at all. It's due by right. I really think the council has to approve it. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Kelly Neff. I also live on Begonia Avenue. Um, I just want to ask you guys the question, what's the point of having a general plan if we're not going to follow it in times where we desperately, desperately need the provisions that it entails to protect the quality of life of our community. Clearly, we've heard, oh, the general plan doesn't matter, land use rights and the owner's rights supersede the general plan, but do they? Has there ever been a precedent set? I think you guys are gonna be the ones to actually set that precedent. I just wanna ask you, a lot of you were involved, I know Nancy Gardner was involved in creating the general plan. Why create it? What's the purpose of it if we're not even going to consider the specific entitlements that it contains to protect and, where feasible, enhance the public view? So considering the community's quality of life versus one person's quality of life, I believe that this was the purpose of the general plan. And you guys, I hope, will take that into consideration when you mitigate um, this issue. There are alternatives that have already been presented that the planning staff actually said meet their alternatives and meet all the things that they need to, in order to build. So that being said, considering those alternatives is a way of preserving the landowner's rights, the land use rights, the zoning rights, and the general plan. Thank you. Any other speakers? Okay, seeing none, I'm going to close uh, the, the, this portion of the hearing and ask the applicant to come forward if you would like for five minutes and make a closing statement. Then I'll ask staff to respond to some of the comments that have been made and then we'll take it back to the council. Well, everybody has their opinion. Our opinion is that we have compromised dramatically the house that we originally wanted, we're not getting. The size of the house we originally wanted, we're not getting. We paid for the lot. We bought the view. And you know, we're not killing the park. The park doesn't need to be saved. It's still going to be there. It still has a wonderful view. And we have tried to do our best to not impact that view as much as possible. We have loaned that view for 13 years 
free of charge. My wife owned a house at 2204 Waterfront. She built it there, and that's just two blocks away from where our current site is. She built it 35 years ago. The house was reversed. The living area was up top. Everything else was down below. Originally, there was a single-story house next door. Recently, two spec homes were built at the corner of Avocado and Waterfront. Totally took away our view. We knew they had a right to do that. We knew that was a risk. She knew that was a risk when she bought that lot. Everyone, when they bought their homes on Begonia and those places, knew that there was a lot there. They should have. They should have asked. I know when we went and my wife bought the view, I helped her buy it a second time. We knew that the lot had an incredible view, and that's why we bought it. We bought it because in our later years, we wanted to be up on Pacific. We didn't want to have to deal with the accidents and the traffic and the blind curve and things like that down on Bayside. We knew that. We checked all that out. And I believe that our house does comply with the general plan. Almost everyone on the, the planning commission helped write the general plan. Most of you in this room helped write the general plan. And I believe if you were going to change the use of our lot, you would have rezoned it, but you didn't. So I'm here tonight just to ask that we get to, to build our home on a property that we've worked very hard over the last three years to try to comply to everything in the general plan and to try to be a good neighbor. And thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. McGonigal. Let me invite Mr. Campbell to come back to the podium and make any, uh, along with uh, the city attorney, if he has any comments, to make any uh, closing comments. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I've um, been listening to the testimony this evening. I only have a couple of brief comments. Um, photograph was brought up with, in the discussion about the view from that park bench, from the street, if you would. Um, that view isn't protected by the general plan, in our opinion, because the general plan specifically identifies streets and public viewpoints to be protected, and that street and that particular corner was not identified by the general plan. Um, so I just want to make that for the record. Uh, second item, um, the discussion about the lower access from Begonia. We did look at that very carefully. We did identify that as potential alternatives to solicit discussion, and, and obviously we've had that this evening. Um, it's really not the safest alternative. I think you can discuss it with the public works director. He's, had this review by the traffic engineer. It's definitely not the safest alternative. It doesn't meet site distance. So is it feasible? Yeah, probably, but you're not going to get the house that really meets all of the project objectives. And I wanted to touch base on some statements that said that staff indicated that it met all of the applicant's objectives. Looking at this from a CEQA perspective, and we did indicate in the EIR that it met most of the basic project objectives of the applicant. However, you'd result in a house that really doesn't provide the view that he's looking for, nor does it have the, um, you know, in essence, one alternative wouldn't have an, a garage. And I know the Planning Commission felt that was pretty important here. The last thing I wanted to indicate, um, we're talking about a subjective question here, whether or not the impact of the view is significant or not, and everyone's going to have a different opinion. And you know, people have been talking about 35 percent, and that must be significant. Well, statistically, maybe in certain cases, but I think you need to look at the broader context. You know, we looked at the entire view, not just the view of the water. We looked at the entire view shed, and that's really touches to the actual threshold of significance that's in the CEQA guidelines that talk about the entire view shed. Um, the focal point is, you know, in essence, the water and the peninsula behind it's, and, and the horizon, and we felt that the, the garage and the residence would block about 35 percent of that. But we also felt that the majority of that view is still there, and so the integrity of the overall view, the quality of the overall view, um, is still preserved, um, hence the, uh, the, the decision to suggest that it is um, 
uh, less than a significant impact. Now, ultimately, the council needs to evaluate that and, and make the final decision um, through their your consideration. So, um, that's all that I really have for you. Do you have any questions? Any questions, Mr. Campbell? <clears throat> I do, Mr. Rosansky. Um, just so I can get to the kind of the heart of the. I mean, we've had talk here about you know like this project, this home had to have an EIR and all these different things that they did that you wouldn't normally see with homes. What 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 has triggered the level of scrutiny here? Why is this even in front of us? Why wasn't this just something that was done over the counter like everybody else's plans are? It, it's really the potential impact of the views of Begonia. Yeah, but it, is that the actual thing? I mean, I'm looking at this. It says this is an application for a modification permit to allow planter walls and a water feature to exceed a three-foot height limit in a five-foot front yard setback. Is that what they're actually asking for here? I mean, is that what has triggered this trip into the approval process? In essence, yes. That is the so discretionary let, application. Okay, and the if they in, didn't encroach into the five-foot setback or exceed the three-foot height limit, would they have had to apply for the modification permit? No, the modification would, permit wouldn't have been required. Okay, so would they have had to go in front of the Planning Commission for approval of their project or come to the City Council or had an EIR done at that point? In, in this particular case, we believe yes, because of the potential impact to the public views, you know, the question would become whether or not that could be approved administratively. And because of that potential impact, um, you know, the, the, really the question wasn't, didn't come forward because we had a discretionary project and CEQA applies to all discretionary projects. Hence, why we went down this process. Well, but at what point did it become discretionary? I guess that's what I want to get at. Day one, with the application that came forward requesting the modification. So, if they didn't ask for the, uh, that's what I'm the point that I'm getting at is that if they didn't ask for the modification permit, they just built their home there with the garage where they're planning on putting it, but just didn't do these encroachments into the setback or the, exceed the height limit. They kept their their planter wall low. They didn't want to build this uh, water feature. Let's say they eliminate it from their plans. Let's say we deny them today, okay? Say, no, we deny you. They go back and redo their plans and eliminate those few things. Are they gonna have to come back through this process again? At this point, yes. Uh, we do believe that even the issuance of the building permit, absent that discretionary application, uh, because of the unique circumstances and potential impact of the view, uh, Council Policy K-3 would authorize uh, to, to elevate this to a discretionary application and be subject to environmental review. So we do believe that those special circumstances pursuant to Council Policy are there, and this would be then discretionary and subject to this level of review. Mm. Thank you. But, me, I, I think you asked Council Member Rosansky if they would have to come back and go through this again. And, and I think the answer to that is no. Remember, the City Attorney at the start of the hearing said, that the council could certify the EIR and deny the project. So in the scenario you present, if the council is inclined to deny it, then I think staff would recommend that um, if you find that the EIR meets the requirements of CEQA, that you certify the EIR. And then if it's denied and the applicant wants to change his application, he doesn't start have to start the CEQA process all over again. Mm -hmm. But he would still ultimately have to go through to the Planning Commission and the City Council to get his project approved? Uh, it would then be a staff approval, although it would be appealable, right? Yes, it would. Thank you. Mr. Henry? I'd like to explore further this issue of the alternative, the viability of the alternative of access off of Bayside Drive. Um, <clears throat> many of the people that have spoken here tonight make much of that, <clears throat> and almost by declaration, uh, uh, you know, uh, affirm that it is a viable alternative, but I, it's not clear to me that that's the case. I want to hear more about what the problems were, what are the problems associated with access off of Bayside Drive, and I know one of them is the site distance thing. I'd like to hear our Director of Public Works address that, but I thought I heard that there were other issues associated with access down there, and can you summarize the other issues? And then maybe, Steve, you can talk about the, the traffic. Certainly. 
Um, I think if we did bring access from below, the question would be would you want a separate driveway or use the existing driveway? And that's something that could be considered. And I know Public Works is not supportive of any additional access down there because of the safety concerns. I'll let Steve address that. But the other issue is really you're going to have to dig into the bluff and do a considerable amount more grading and excavation to get that basement level down at that level. You would likely need a four-story house in order to get the view that they're re achieving from the main living level of the house um, to eliminate the garage from above. And so there's an extra 10 to 12 feet in there that, that really makes it difficult, again, to put an elevator in. You'd have to dig out deep in order to get up. So, I mean, these, these are kind of design considerations that make it quite difficult. Um, and, and obviously a lot more grading in order to accomplish that. And, and I'm not certain that that meets all of the ob applicant's objectives. Of course, he wanted a view, and I'm not sure he would get the same view. Um, Steve, maybe you can address the safety issue. Yes, um, Councilman Han and, and Council. Um, regarding the, um, the safety issue, um, essentially our city traffic engineer, Tony Bryan, re reviewed that area. He checked that the he found that the average uh, 85th percentile speed in that area is 28 miles an hour. And with that equates to um, a sight distance that he, he cited at around 200 feet. Now, if we go into strict, uh, I think we could probably argue, you know, different kinds of standards and that maybe could be shortened a bit to make it work. But I guess his, the real opinion from, you know, our opinion from a traffic engineering perspective is that given the two alternatives, certainly the Pacific Drive is the safer alternative. Um, adding another driveway uh, onto that section of uh, Bayside Drive is probably not a really good idea in our opinion. Uh, it is possible to do. Um, regarding the existing driveway, um, I think there was a statement made we could share that driveway. Well, actually we can't. Um, that driveway was built under an encroachment agreement. Wait that you, said, you said you cannot? Yeah, that, that adjacent property owner uh, built that driveway and has permission to have that driveway there. He is maintaining it. Um, and he is the owner of that improvement with permission of the city. That is revocable. Okay, so the now, city could revoke that permit and reissue it based on a joint use if we wanted to. It is possible to do that, but uh, I would question who would, who would take that responsibility. I guess it would be the, the applicant for the whole access for all of those properties. But we could build a parallel driveway adjacent to it. Um, it does, would take a substantial piece of park. Um, the property owner would have to have enough space to turn around because we would not want anyone backing onto Bayside. So there would have to be a, what we call a little hammerhead for them to do that. They couldn't back over someone else's property. Um, you know, if you look on the aerial photo, you could simply say, well, you just go straight in and that's fine. Well, it doesn't necessarily work that way. The orientation of that property to build a two-car garage would probably have to be parallel to that existing property line. Uh, it's a little hard to describe without a map on the wall. But in order to make, you know, an appropriate advance into that garage, you have to have an, a, a radius that would work. So uh, we did put together a little sketch and we, we passed it out to you to show one potential way that that might work. It would take a little bit of extra park. Um, yeah, there might be a possibility of shrinking it down and maybe sharing, but certainly we'd have to explore that with that, with that property owner. But I guess the point that we wanted to make was that given the two alternatives, certainly the Pacific Drive is the safer of the two. So on net, the traffic engineer recommended against the Bayside and as well that as is yourself. Correct. But what's involved with the dedication of additional parkland? Uh, let's assume that, you know, we wanted to really seriously explore this parallel driveway. What's involved with dedicating, for the city dedicating, I guess, an easement? Uh, oh, it would be an encroachment agreement similar to what the existing uh, home at 2360 already has. It would be a simple encroachment agreement. It's, it's not an extended, difficult public process. No, it's not. We'd probably bring it back to you since it does involve parkland unless you gave us that direction tonight. Okay. I, I have some additional questions for the city attorney, but I'd be glad to turn over the okay. dais to Brett. anyone else that has questions. I, I have, uh, it's kind of interesting when we start talking about sight distance and speeds and, and all that kind of stuff because uh, I look just at, at the drawing, which is very much similar to the one that's on the, on the board right there, and I look at, at uh, how much farther this uh, uh, 
potential driveway into McDonald's property would be away from the curve than a number of the houses that are just beyond the curve. Uh, from the standpoint of we, if this is going to be an unsafe driveway, we have many driveways that are perhaps even more unsafe. I, I really question the 28 mile an hour uh, 85th percentile speed from the standpoint of I think that if you were to actually look at that data, that the radar unit that was taking those speeds, and again, I'm just guessing here, and I don't know for sure, is sighting down the straight stretches in both directions because the person says that they're standing right in the middle of the curve. So they really aren't getting the speed going around the curve. The speed in the curve, according to the, uh, the, 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 the sign that is posted in both directions is supposed to be, the advisory sign is supposed to be no more than 20 miles an hour. Now, a 20 mile an hour stopping sight distance is probably closer to 125 feet instead of 200 feet. And uh, a potential new driveway would be in the 170 to 175 foot range, which is very close to even the stopping sight distance for 28 miles an hour. Isn't that correct? Yeah, I think it starts getting close to it, but we typically use the minimum of 200. I guess, you know, what you're talking about is you could realign that driveway anywhere you want if you're willing to give up parkland. And we could yeah. certainly slide it another 50 feet. We could slide it 100 foot. We could slide it all the way to Carnation if you want. I know that so, we can do pretty much of any way we want. But <laughs> you know, that's what we, want, we can play with the sight distance. I guess that's my point is, yes, there is a way to make it work if you really want to make it work. We think the better alternative certainly is uh, Pacific Drive based upon the loss of parkland and, and the encroachment to public park. That was certainly the easiest solution. Now, I don't pretend to be the judge of <laughs> views or anything else, and I'm glad I'm not sitting up there. Well, so, uh, but the, from a public works perspective, from a traffic engineering perspective, we feel that the Pacific Drive access is, is the safer of the two. I, the, uh, from the standpoint of the amount of traffic on Bayside Drive versus Pacific Drive, you're always going to get a little bit safer situation where you have less traffic than where you have more traffic. I, I don't disagree with that. Uh, I, I, I guess that, that to me, uh, as I look at the, the situation, and our, our attorney was started off with um, telling us about opinions and experts and, and such as that, and, and I'm not sure how we get an expert on views. Uh, when you get, I, as far as I'm concerned, I listened to a bunch of experts on the view out there. I heard a, ma a significant majority indicating that in their opinion there was a loss, significant loss of view if we have a garage up off of, a, uh, of uh, Pacific. I know that the one young lady that said she uh, was going to lose the place where she got married, I've already lost my place. It was a church in Nebraska and it's been torn down and moved in front, into a farm field. So I've, I figure I've lost that already. But I think that, that the, the view here is something that is of great significance and I, I, I cannot, in, in my opinion, I cannot make a, 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 a be a part of, of a finding in an environmental document that says that this view is less than significant, or the loss of the view is less than significant. I think it is a very significant view loss and I think that the option that allows for <clears throat> access off of base side can be done in a, in a safe enough manner to where Yes, it's going to be a little bit more inconvenient for the McGonagall's because they're going to have to tell, take an elevator up instead of down from the top. But <clears throat> uh, I, I feel that that's the direction that, that, that the city council should go on this. I think, Mr. Hinn, I believe you had some questions for the city attorney. I, I, I do, actually. Uh, it, it appears from what was said tonight that the view impairment ranges from 35% at the vantage point of the Begonia bench to something less than that as you move up and around the park to the east. And frankly, I've been out there two or three times myself, and I would, I would generally concur with my own, you know, uh, uh, look at the situation that that's the case. So my question is, though, does the general, does the general plan require us to prevent any view impairment? 
Uh, and then I have a follow-up to that. No. As many things have been said about a violation of the general plan. Your, the specific answer to your question is no. The general plan does not say you may not have any impairment of public views. The, okay. It's the opinion of planning staff, the planning commission, the consultant who conducted the EIR, that there's not a violation of our general plan. That's not the issue. The, the, the proposed development is consistent with the general plan. The question is a California Environmental Quality Act issue, and that is whether or not the loss of approximately 35 percent of the public view <clears throat> is significant. This is where I want to echo what Mr. Batum said. I'm glad I don't sit up there with you. Um, that is a decision for you to make. To comment, to respond, if I may, briefly to Councilmember Webb, yes, the people who testify that says I've lived there 30 years, 20 years, 10 years, four minutes, five days, I've walked the property, it's significant, is substantial evidence. Because they were there, they can make that assessment. It doesn't require a degree in engineering, you know, statistical analysis, architecture, anything, to say that's significant. They've rendered a statement of fact and an opinion to them that you can consider. I would tell you that there's substantial evidence on both sides of the issue. This is where you weigh the evidence and make a determination as to what you feel is appropriate. So thank you for leaving us on tinter hooks with that comment. Um, but beyond that, then, uh, in the in view of the fact that the view does the view impairment does change from different vantage points in the park, are we commanded to consider the worst case view as we evaluate what's a significant view loss and what isn't? No, you're not. You have to look at the entire impact on the view and analyze it as a full view shed as discussed by um, so view Mr. shed not just in the in the perspective of what we see when we look out there but view shed of what we see from various vantage points as Correct. we look out. in begonia park view various various vantage point vantage points within the public view okay. as defined by your general plan which is begonia park and not the individualized streets okay thank you councilman gardner Mr. Mr. Mayor, before we go too far down the road, can I just address some of the legal questions that were raised by comments before, if, if that's acceptable? Um, the, a number of things have been said, and I've addressed the issue of substantial evidence. There have been things talking about private property rights, taking uh, private property rights, et cetera. I would uh, assure the council that whatever decision you make tonight, you are not taking anyone's private property rights. I think you will hear me say this many times. To use the nomenclature to say that someone has a right to build on land is not an accurate statement under the law. As Councilmember Rosansky has reminded me many times, the law doesn't dictate decisions. There are moral and ethical issues that have to be looked at. That's your purview. The law is mine. They don't have a right to build legally on the land. This is an issue of significant environmental effect. You could certify the EIR changing the finding if it were your choice to say that the 35 percent is a significant impact that must be mitigated and you can certify the EIR as being a complete and appropriate document and instruct and then deny the project and that's what I was trying to say earlier that uh, the assistant city manager would have indicated it would force the McGonagall's to come up with an alternative or abandon the project entirely but that is one of the options that's before you um, the, the, the the question that was asked by Councilmember Rosansky is an important one uh, dealing with what would happen if they modified their project, depending on what kind of modification that they came forward with, assuming that they were not fully approved tonight. Uh, <laughs> it could result in any number of different things. If you certified the EIR with a change in findings that is significant, essentially an EIR would have been completed. The question would then be uh, under CEQA as to what further analysis would be necessary that was compelled by any modification of the project. So if you chose to say, we like the alternative that coming down from, coming up from Bay Side Drive uh, and want that further analyzed, that's what would be analyzed, but they wouldn't go through the whole EIR process. process it could either be through a subsequent EIR or an addendum. Um, so there are a lot of things out there. And I would say normally, and one of the things that we've talked about as staff is what would happen if they modified their permit and released the, the discretionary applications. Uh, Normally under CEQA, the issuance of a building permit is ministerial in nature and thus exempt from CEQA pursuant to statutory provisions. 
Your council policy K3, however, states that even build, building permits that have unusual circumstances that impact scenic resources could be discretionary in nature even though generally they're ministerial and therefore the planning director who's your environmental coordinator could make the determination further CEQA analysis was necessary. So there's no silver bullet out there. And that takes us right back to the question of is this a significant impact upon the public views and that's your determination to make and you have substantial evidence on both sides and I would suggest that's what you have to struggle with. Councilmember Carter. Uh, I had a senior moment last week, <laughs> a major one, in that I, when the, uh, in a conversation, someone said, when, when you appealed the McGonagall decision, I said, I appealed it? Uh, so much had gone on that I had forgotten it. Certainly, uh, when I sat down and I thought about it, I recalled why I did, which was because I was spent four and a half years on the general plan, and I felt that this was one of the first real examinations of general plan policies, and it was something that the city council should opine on. Um, the McGonagall's bought a lot. They have the right to build. Unfortunately, they didn't build five years ago. <laughs> five years ago, if they'd build, uh, we might have had the same number of people here, but there wouldn't have been much to hang their hat on. We have a new general plan, and the general plan has some policies. And while you talk about, uh, I think it was mentioned that, well, you know, people say they voted on the general plan, but they only voted on that one element. But those of us who worked to get the general plan passed, we didn't talk about that one element, because that element talked about growth and things. We talked about things like public views and water quality protection. Those were the things that were selling the fact that we were going to have some growth as well in, in buildings. So, I mean, I do think that people, people felt they were voting for these policies. And it is. It's very subjective. I went back. As soon as this came up, I went back to my GPAC minutes, uh, General Plan Advisory Committee minutes, because I thought maybe there'd be something in the minutes that would give me some insight as to how we came up with some of these things. And the only thing I came up with was a comment from John Coro, who was saying as we're talking about public views, well, if we don't quantify them, <laughs> then it's going to be difficult. Well, John, thank you. You should have insisted that we quantify them, because obviously, if we went and had quantified the various public views that we named in the, in the general plan, our job would be easy. But we didn't, so we've left it very subjective. And we just say we all want to protect and enhance. And I, I understand the concept of the whole view shed, but I think if you asked the average person, and forget Begonia Park, but you just ask the average person what your view idea is, and it's, it's of the water. So. I have to disagree with staff and with the Planning Commission. I do feel that this is a significant impact on the view. As I say, that's a, it's, it's, a, it's subjective. I, I understand that people can very well disagree. Uh, as far as different vantage points, we make a big deal out of the dot. That it's the dot, it's not the view from Begonia, and Pacific because we don't call it out, we have the dot. Well then, if the dot's that important that says the view from Pacific and Begonia doesn't count, then the view down the slope probably doesn't count as much either. We're thinking only of that one view, but that one view is certainly impactful. I would have to agree that 30% that to me is a significant impact. What I'm not sure about though is, is the the next step because I, I, I'm not an engineer and when engineers tell me, oh, it's difficult to do this, uh, I tend to give some credence to that. Um, so I, I would love some, some guidance. I mean, it, uh, first of all, I should say, obviously, if only one or two of us feel that it's a significant impact, we can all go home because that makes it real easy and maybe that's something we need to discuss first. And then if we do feel it's a significant impact, then can we come up with a solution? I mean, I, I don't necessarily have, have the solution. So perhaps that would be a straw vote might be in order or a discussion of whether it is a significant impact because, as I say, if there's not an agreement there, then that we don't need to discuss anything else. Yeah, does anyone else? Mr. Selich. Yeah, I'll comment on that. I, I do not think it's a, a significant impact. Um, I am persuaded by the experts that uh, wrote the EIR. I know we had a lot of opinions in 
here this evening. I think a lot of them are based on people's um, emotions. We had objective analysts look at this. They weren't on the side of the opponents or the proponent of the project. They were objective analysts of it. Um, I believe the Planning Commission did an admirable job in their view of this project. They, they designed the project in such a way to mitigate any impact upon the view. In fact, uh, I think you could say that they mitigated it to a level of insignificance, uh, not only by the design that they did, but by the fact that they placed a view easement over the property that we would otherwise not get. And when you take the totality of the view shed, what we see are the worst view simulations there are because obviously the people that are opposed to the project want to present that situation to convince us that uh, you know, we're destroying the view. But when you take a look at the total view shed and all of the different points of view, it is not a, uh, it is not a significant impact upon the view. So I am uh, compelled to uh, follow the uh, advice of our staff, the experts that we hired, the Planning Commission, who spent a lot of time on this, and uh, find that uh, there is no significant impact to the view. Okay. Councilmember Daigle? Uh, I would concur with uh, Councilman Selich's assessment. Let me uh, say for my own, first of all, I've appreciated the, the comments tonight, the tone of the comments tonight, and the emails that we've received from, from many of you on both sides of this issue. Uh, the one thing that everyone seems to agree is that Mr. McGonigal has the right to build something on this property. The issue is, uh, does he have, uh, can it be configured in such a way that he can build a reasonable home under reasonable circumstances? Uh, Mr. Crittenden, for example, forwarded a particularly thoughtful email uh, exploring the idea of access from, uh, from Bayside Drive. I asked staff to look at that and to explore the issue. And while uh, Mr. Batum has, I think, been perhaps more overly generous in suggesting that there's a way that it could be done by taking parkland, the actual response from the city's traffic engineer uh, was as follows. I told the Planning Commission that I did not support a lower driveway access because there is an adequate site distance. As far as I'm concerned, there is clearly not sufficient site distance for a safe access. City traffic engineer goes on to write, uh, the Bayside location does not support approving a new driveway with unsafe access when the safe option exists. So if there's not an access for a garage from Bayside that can be reasonably construed to be safe, uh, then I don't believe we have an alternative uh, for Mr. McGonigal other than the one that he has presented to us today. And if we accept the fact that he has the right to build a home on this property, then I think we need to accept the one that he has proposed to build. Mr. Mr. Hand. Um, I likewise am now not convinced that the alternative access off of Bayside Drive is safe and appropriate. Um, it seems to me, in addition to the city traffic engineer's judgment here, um, there's the solution would otherwise be contorted and quite burdensome uh, to execute and it does it just doesn't seem to be appropriate I, I do subscribe to council member Selich's view that we have to consider the entirety of the view shed and um, I think this issue in the general plan the language that says we're feasible um, is language that gets us into a judgmental call here about how much of an impact is significant. I don't know how to define the word significant, Mr. City Attorney. I just think of it in terms of does it rise to a level that should require us to invalidate the other underpinning of the general plan that's at play here, which is to preserve the entitlements of people who do own property to use it and enjoy it uh, within their entitlements. And this project, as described, does do that in my view and uh, so therefore I'm in the camp that uh, the view impairment there is some view impairment no doubt of it does not rise to the significance of uh, invalidating the project someone like to offer a motion um, I'll move that uh, that we um, Adopt resolution number 2010 certifying the McNonagle Residence uh, Environmental Impact Report and adopt a mitigation monitoring and reporting program and adopt the resolution approving the modification permit uh, 20780 subject to the findings and conditions. Is there any further, uh, is there a second? Second. 
Is there any further discussion on the motion? Please vote. With council members Webb and Gardner voting no, the motion carries. Next item is item 20. God, I got so excited. Ah, <laughs> David, do you have David, do you have revised copies of this? We're just checking on that, Mr. Mayor. Give us a moment, please. Okay. Can I leave? thank you. Oh, oh I see. Okay. Maybe give one to Mike. There were them. Let's, if, if we could ask uh, those who are not staying for item 20 to please file out into the hall and. Uh, At our um, council workshop on Saturday, we uh, discussed uh, what I'm calling a fiscal sustainability plan, which is a declaration of the principles that the council will adhere to as we address the current economic situation. There's no doubt that uh, the city is in a difficult situation, the economy is in a situation, our residents and our businesses are also in a tough situation. And before we address the critical issues that are going to come before our city during the course of this year, I believe it's important for us to assure the residents that we're going to put our fiscal house in order and that we're going to manage our city appropriately. Based on the input of all of the city council at our planning workshop on Saturday, we have identified, I think, 15 principles uh, that put us in a good position to address that issue proactively. And collectively, I think these, three, these 15 points address three major points. First of all, they say we recognize that preserving the health and the underlying strength of our economy, supporting our businesses and upholding the property values of our community is important to preserving our economic and fiscal stability. That, by the way, is the primary thing that the state of California has missed as they have tried to address this issue on a statewide basis. The second thing it says is that we're going to live within our means. We're going to manage so that we are within our tax revenues and we're going to reduce spending accordingly and we're going to monitor our tax revenues to make sure that we do that. And we're not going to draw down our, reviews, our reserves to dangerous levels because that's the debate that's happening in a lot of different communities. And the third thing it says is that we're going to manage our community better. We're going to use innovation. We're going to manage uh, in a way that uh, is effective and efficient in how we provide services. So I think we had a very good discussion on Saturday. I believe this is an important statement for us to make as we begin the new fiscal year, and I would introduce this item for your consideration. Uh, Dave, I think, has done a very good job in his staff report in outlining sort of how this can be tangibilized through the course of the year. Uh, well, I Ms. would Gardner? like to move the action. I just want to commend you, Mr. Mayor, for uh, leading this and presenting such a good document that we can work from. Thank you. I'll Thank second you. that. Thank you. Mr. Rosansky, any or any further discussion? Any further discussion? Mr. Mr. Mayor, before, before the council votes, I actually have a couple of a different, a couple of additional changes to. And I'm going from the document that says, uh, it looks like this. Right. Um, I noticed that I referred to them as 14 under the resolve. So, I'd, your permission, I'd change that to the number 15. Under that, again, the first mm -hmm. resolve on right. page one. And then uh, Mayor Curry was noting that uh, we should be referring to the facilities financing plan. So there are two places where I refer to it as a right. facilities replacement plan. So I'd like to change those two. With that, I think it's ready to go. Thank you. I move it with those corrections. <coughs> second. I second that too. Are there any uh, comments from the public on this matter? Seeing none, please vote. The motion carries unanimously. Okay. Get back over here. Madam Clerk, motion for reconsideration. A motion to reconsider the vote on any action taken by the City Council at either this meeting or the previous meeting may be made only by one of the Council members who voted with the prevailing side. 
Are there any motions for reconsideration? Seeing none, uh, we're going to uh, adjourn uh, the meeting tonight uh, in memory of several people. Uh, the uh, December-January period has been a particularly tragic one for the Newport Beach community. We've lost some of our uh, leading figures in the community, and tonight we want to take a, a bit of time to uh, remember them. Uh, and we're going to adjourn in the memory of several people. The first is Roy Disney. Roy E. Disney was the son of Roy O. Disney and the nephew of Walt Disney, the founder of the Walt Disney Company, who died at Hogue Hospital in December. He's a graduate of Pomona College. He worked briefly for NBC before joining the Disney Company, working as an editor, a screenwriter, and producer. And although he never led the company, Mr. Disney had significant impact as a member of its board of directors. As a member of the Newport Harbor Yacht Club, Mr. Disney is a world-class sailor and an avid promoter of the sport. He enjoyed yacht racing and set several speed records. He was a fixture at the Transpac a yacht race between California and Hawaii, and he and his 12-member crew won the biennial race in record time in 1999, placed third in 2004. Mr. Disney was also a regular participant in the Newport to Ensenada International Yacht Race, and he participated in about half of the events, 62 races, and twice held the elapsed time record for mono hulls. In 2005, he donated his prize-winning yacht, the 86-foot Paywacket, to the Orange Coast College School of Sailing and Seamanship, and thus marked his retirement from uh, competitive sailing. Mr. Disney was an active philanthropist and served as honorary chairman of the biennial first team real estate imitation regatta for the Hogue Cup. But let me also say that he was an active supporter of the Newport uh, Harbor uh, Maritime, or the Newport um, uh, Maritime Museum, uh, and if you had an opportunity during the Newport Beach Film Festival to be there a year and a half ago when he hosted some animated shorts out of the Disney vault, it was a magical evening of, uh, of uh, animation that he brought to our community and he will be sorely missed. Nancy Bergeson is the daughter of Newport Beach residents Marion and Garth Bergeson, who died on November 24th in Portland, Oregon. Uh, the Bergeson family is well known in Newport Beach as Marion has served our community as a school board trustee, county supervisor, and member of the state legislature. Nancy Bergeson was born in Utah and spent her childhood in Newport Beach. She attended Mariners Elementary School, Instant Intermediate, and Newport Harbor High. Ms. Bergenson earned her undergraduate and law degrees at the University of Utah, and she initially practiced law in Salt Lake City, most recently serving for nearly 18 years with the Federal Public Defender's Office in Portland, Oregon. At the time of her death, Ms. Bergeson was an assistant public defender for criminal cases, specializing in conspiracy and white-collar crimes. While she was known for a deep commitment to her work and clients, Ms. Bergeson was also an avid athlete who enjoyed hiking, skiing, and traveling the world as a member of a dragon boat racing team in addition to her parents, she is survived by her daughter, Jamie, brothers, Garth and James, sisters, Julie, and her nieces and nephews. Newport Beach resident and re renowned evangelist Oral Roberts died at Hogue Hospital in December. A native of Oklahoma, Mr. Roberts served as pastor of churches in Oklahoma and Georgia and preached at revivals around the country while studying at Oklahoma Baptist University and Phillips University in Oklahoma. He was a pioneer of televangelism and reached millions of people worldwide through radio, television, publications, and personal appearances. He also published dozens of books and conducted hundreds of evangelistic and faith healing crusades. After retiring to Newport Beach, Mr. Roberts continued his biblical study and he enjoyed golf. It was frequently that we would play behind uh, Pastor Roberts at the Newport Beach Country Club. He used to, to go for a tea time about the same time that Pamela and I would go over there and it was always fun to follow him around the course Eventually, he quit playing golf, but he lived on the second tee, and so he would wave sometimes, and of course, you'd hope that you didn't flub your shot up while he, was, while he was watching you, but he was a very important part of our community. He was preceded in death by his wife of 66 years, Evelyn. Uh, Mr. Roberts is survived by his son, Richard, daughter, Roberta, and their spouses, 12 grandchildren and several great-grandchildren. Uh, Supervisor Harriet Weeder, who passed away on Monday, was a friend of more than 30 years for both uh, Councilman Selich and myself, and I'd like to recognize Councilman Selich to say a few words about Harriet. Thank you, Mayor. Um, Harriet was a dear friend of my wife, Lynn, and myself. Um, <coughs> she was really a longtime icon of Orange politics County. in uh, Orange County. She was a pioneer for women in politics, actually, at a time when women stayed home and baked cookies and raised a family. Uh, she was plowing ground in local government. Uh, she was an aide to Los Angeles Mayor Sam Yorty, and even though she couldn't keep Mayor Sam from putting his foot in his mouth, those of you that remember Sam Yorty, 
Uh, she was an effective and uh, energetic aide to him. She went on to serve on the Huntington Beach City Council, including being mayor, which is when I first met her. Thanks to her confidence and a young 20-something upstart, I was appointed head of planning and redevelopment uh, in Huntington Beach. Uh, at that time, councilmen had, say, had a say-so in Huntington Beach over who got to be department heads, not so today. Um, over time, uh, Harriet and I became good friends as well as colleagues, and we've remained so for all these intervening years. She went on to become the first female county supervisor and board chairman. She served on the board for 16 years. I can tell you she was dynamic and irrepressible. It was hard for any staff to keep up with her as she had so many ideas and projects that she wanted to pursue. After her term on the board, Harriet kept an active public life. She founded a public affairs consulting firm and even found time to publish her memoirs. Now, one of my most memorable moments with uh, Harriet, and she and I would always chuckle over this uh, almost every time we'd get together, was during the, the Huntington Beach Downtown Redevelopment Plan hearings. So many people came to these hearings that uh, they couldn't fit into the building. And if you're familiar with the Huntington Beach City Council, there's a grass knoll that rolls up onto the roof. So the people were on the roof jumping up and down. They were pressing against the glass doors and walls so heavily that the police were called in to prevent them from collapsing. And that's the walls, not the people. And so Harriet comes up to me in a panic and said, Ed, what do we do now? So I said, Harriet, adjourn the meeting. Wise advice. So we adjourned the meeting and later we had, I think two weeks, we had a redevelopment hearing in a high school gym with about 2,000 people showed up at that hearing and uh, it was quite an introduction for me as a young fellow into local government. And coincidentally, before I began dating my wife, Lynn, Harriet was a mentor to her when she was assigned to take Lynn under her wing as a new member of the Cancer Society's Orange County uh, Barons Ball. Uh, she greatly inspired Lynn, as I'm sure she did many of the women with whom she crossed paths. Although she was a longtime resident of Huntington Beach, uh, Harriet spent her later years here in Newport Beach residing at the Balboa Bay Club. She kept an uh, eye on local affairs, and I can tell you she critically evaluated my performance here on the City Council. And uh, Lynn and I would see her around town frequently. Uh, the last time was at the mayor's reception at the Back Bay Cafe in December. And although she was frail in physical condition, she was spirited and as irrepressible as ever. Uh, Lynn and I are happy we got to spend a little time with her there. Harriet had enthusiastically accepted an invitation to be at our home for a holiday reception, but she was not there. Lynn and I were curious as to why she was not able to come, and, and now we know. We wish to extend our condolences to her daughter, Gail Weber, Weeder Tauber, and uh, her son-in-law, Phil Tauber, Son Leland, who's about my age and who I knew quite well in Huntington Beach. Daughter-in-law, Diane Weeder, plus many grandchildren and great-grandchildren. Uh, she was an icon and she will be sorely missed. Thank you, Ed. Uh, Bill Grundy, a longtime city resident and developer of uh, Linda Island uh, and also Citizen of the Year in 2002, also passed away on uh, uh, recently. And uh, to make some uh, remembrances for Mr. Grundy, let me uh, turn it over to Councilman Webb. When I was uh, Centennial, I, I shouldn't say was, uh, as Centennial Mayor, uh, one of the he won't give it up. One of the things one of the things I did was uh, consult with uh, Mr. Grundy on on uh, history of Newport because he was uh, he founded the uh, Newport Beach uh, Historical Society back in in uh, the 1960s. Uh, he was uh, also the son of one of the first doctors in. Uh, uh, well, actually, the first doctor in, in the city of Newport Beach. And uh, the palm trees that are down in the McFadden Square area were transplanted there from in front of uh, what was his uh, father's office that turned into a hospital and so on and so forth. But at any rate, uh, Bill was uh, uh, earned his bachelor's degree from USC, a master's degree in business administration. Uh, he worked as an engineer for Beckman Instruments and, and uh, he used aircraft. He was a sales manager for the Irvine Company. Uh, he was a resident of Lido, Isle. Uh, he served uh, as an usher at St. Andrew's Church for 50 years. Uh, he founded the Newport Beach Historical Society, as I mentioned, and served as, as its only president. So he was in quite, a, quite a few years as president. Uh, he's survived by his wife, Audrey, and, and son, Gordy, his daughter, uh, Lisa Johnson, and son-in-law, Bill Johnson, grandson, Willis Johnson, and sister Helen Ann Landgrad. Land, 
Lang mad, excuse me. Uh, it's, uh, he had a, a, a small little real estate office over here on 33rd Street, and, and uh, when you could find him there, uh, I was always interested to go in, and, and I, I remember he, uh, uh, one time I was there, he pulled out this little old book that was uh, pamphlet, as I should say. Here, Don, you can have this. It was the history that, uh, a short history that had been put together about uh, uh, the uh, uh, Mr. Beak who founded the ferry and some of the stories that uh, were told around the time that uh, he did that. And he had all these little cubby holes full of historical stuff that he'd just share with you. And then we had another uh, leading citizen pass away also in the, during the holiday period, uh, George Bissell. And uh, Councilmember Webb will also do a remembrance for Mr. Bissell. Uh, George Bissell was uh, an architect. Uh, he uh, died uh, or passed away January 2nd. He was 82 years old. Uh, he established uh, his office here in Newport Beach in 1960. So he served in the Newport Beach area in an architectural capacity for many, many years. There's, uh, I, I can't name any specific structures right now, but there uh, are a number of, 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 of facilities that he participated in, in working with. I know that he worked with another architect, uh, Herb Riley. We, both of them lived on Lido Isle, and the two of them got together, and there's several city projects that the two of them worked on together. He was an avid sailor and enjoyed many years as a crew member on Jim Kilroy's Kealoa II. And if you remember Kealoa too, it was one of the fastest boats in the in the 70s, <clears throat> for the, particularly in the uh, the Transpac race. Uh, he was a member of the both the Newport Harbor Yacht Club and the Lido Isle Yacht Club and the Transpac Yacht Club. Uh, I'd like to extend our condolences to uh, his wife uh, Laurie, five children: Terry, Tom, Bill, Bob, and Katie. He's also sur survived by seven grandchildren. Thank you, Don. It's a sad time. Uh, we stand adjourned. <laughs>